Hey, everybody, and welcome to the start of Division B of the Pro Chess Summer Series. Uh, I'm International Master David Proust, and today I'm joined by Levy Rosman. Levy, hi. Hi, David. Excited to be uh, doing my first first rodeo with this. All right. Did you see that? Uh, did you see which two teams came through from Division A? I did. I did. Uh, I don't think it was that surprising. <laughs> I was going to say, any surprises there? Not really. Two final four teams, the Pandas and the and the Archbishops, already through to the Summer Series Championships. And uh, the rest of the uh, Summer Series Championship bracket is still to be filled out, but that'll be played at the end of August with uh, two teams from each of the four divisions. Um, and then uh, two more teams that got third place to be voted in by a Twitter vote by all of you out there on uh, August 17th. And uh, yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have like four on four pro chess league matches in that summer series championships. But for now, it's up to the fans to get their two teams into um, into that summer series championships. So, um, Levy, which teams do we have participating today? Well, if anybody that doesn't know, uh, we have obviously, as David mentioned. Uh, we're talking about Division B, so all the teams have already played. Uh, today, we are going to be seeing Baden-Baden go up against Barcelona uh, and Pittsburgh going up against Reykjavik. So the interesting thing here is Baden-Baden uh, is actually a Final Four team, right? They they even made it to the final match uh, over in yeah. San Francisco. Uh, so this is kind of their quest at redemption. They're, they're, they're also their quest potentially to maintain dominance. We've seen them be a, a powerhouse team throughout uh, the Pro Chess League season that just went by. And then on the other side, there's teams like the Reykjavik Puffins, who, first of all, when I went to Reykjavik a couple of years ago, I didn't even see any Puffins, even though it was Puffin season, and we didn't see the Puffins in the Pro Chess League. So okay. this is kind of their quest back, to, to maybe get back into it slowly. Uh, same thing goes for the Pond Grabbers and uh, you know, the Raptors as well. So I don't know, who, who, who do we have? Uh, who do you have today, I should say? Who do I have in the matches today? Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's a little bit... I guess we won't go into too much detail just now, but I would say Baden, Baden, and then Pittsburgh. If I just had to pick real quick. Um, but uh, we also want to let everybody know that they can still join this tournament for either the Barcelona Raptors or the Baden, Baden team. That's going to be the first match today, Baden, Baden against Barcelona. So you can join the Raptors club or the Baden, Baden club, and then you can um, go join the tournament uh in live chess and you can participate it's starting in 14 minutes and uh we're gonna uh take a quick break now while you guys have a chance to go figure that out and join up and when we come back we're going to have an interview with the barcelona raptors pro chess league player and star daniel forson esteban i think
All right, and we're back. That was fast, right? Uh, well, we got to be fast because we've got a rapid chess match coming up in 11 minutes. Um, we're really happy now to be joined by Grandmaster Daniel Forsen. Thank you for being here with us, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for you. Um, well, anybody who watched the uh, Pro Chess League Central Division this past season um, would be familiar with you. You played a lot of games and very uh, successfully for the Raptors. Yeah. Um, how did you enjoy the, the regular season? This was the first season for the Raptors. Yeah, it was my first season also for in, in chess.com. And okay, it was really fun. Yeah, I used to strain also. Mm -hmm. And I think I did more or less a, a good performance. Maybe it could be yeah. better. But yeah, okay, it's a, a team of friends. I mean, the, the, the captain is a, a friend of mine, Jose. And okay, it was really fun. Really fun. Okay, cool. Have you played in other leagues? Like, do you play in any European leagues on no. teams? I mean, no. no. So this is kind of rare for you to play a, a team event like this. Yeah, yeah. It was my first time like like this. Yeah. Cool. Hey, you know, I, I I have a question. So I don't know how much uh, you follow the league uh, in, in the playoffs, but we we see teams like the Armenia Eagles have a big sense of team. Like they're always playing in the same room. Uh, they're always kind of cheering each other on. Uh, what was the team spirit like of the Barcelona Raptors? What would you want the fans to know about the Barcelona Raptors? Are you all friends? Are you friendly? Do you prepare together? Things like that. Yeah, well, we are friends and we have, of course, a, a WhatsApp chat. So we can talk in, in that chat and okay, we, we talk to each other and we try to prepare some games and i think it's more or less a friendly team and okay everyone can follow it and can have a, a nice time a nice time and also the, the streaming of, of jose herrera of steve griffin he used mm -hmm. to do some some things to the fans also and they can follow it and, and play with him Cool. And today, I mean, your team is going to be bigger. Today, you're you're dropping the other the other Raptors and replacing them with Raptors fans. So you'll be first board for your team, and then there are going to be a whole bunch of chess fans playing with you. How do you feel about this format of having like, you know, just any random fan of of <laughs> you or the team playing with you? I think, I think it's a, a great format that people can play with with another grandmaster in the team and and feel like in a team with with good players and okay i feel really great to to be the first board the not the cup time but okay the first board of the of this team and with a lot of people following it cool and then i want to ask you i mean the raptors were relegated this year and you started out the season in first place in the central division right and then yeah. in a heartbreaking last week you guys dropped to the relegation spot. Um, ha what happened between such like an amazing beginning for a new team? Everybody was asking, who are these guys? Why are they so good? And then what what happened? Did anything change over the season for you? Did the other teams get stronger? Yeah, I don't know. We feel like we were really good. I mean, I was four out of four this, this first day and also some teammates three out of four. But suddenly we started to lose a lot of games and I don't know, it's like we didn't focus enough in, in the last match or maybe mm -hmm. we just think don't release was, was enough and we didn't play for, for the first place. Okay. Like when you weren't playing for first place, you were maybe less motivated to play your best? Yeah, maybe we, we should start to play, I don't know, I don't know which was or fail, but yeah, we suddenly started to lose. And okay, we also lose a lot of games with advantage. So I don't know what what happened, but I think this year will be better. Okay, so you guys have plans to go through the qualification after the uh, summer series and get back into the central division for next year. Yeah, I don't know if we the with the same players, but I think most of them will play another time with Barcelona Rator, and I hope we can play next year also in the league. Well, I understand you're not the manager, but I mean, you're a player who's played a lot and been really involved. Do you have any thoughts of what the team would need to do differently next year to fight for first place? Maybe we can prepare together or I don't know, focus more. Do 
not give away some of your preparation that you're saving for like a classical tournament? I'm always curious what grandmasters think about that. Yeah, I, I was preparing like a classic game, but suddenly I saw that games, you can also see the games in chess base, for example, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized that, that in classical game now, there is not a surprise with that openings. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's difficult. I used to play random things, not random, but not the normal things. But of course, if you, if you want to win uh, a good player, you have to play the, the best opening also. So yeah, it's difficult. It's like, I don't want to to play uh, the better the best one, but okay, I, I want to win the game. <laughs> so it's like a mix of, of them. Yeah, I had that problem as well when I was playing in the league. I was trying to play garbage, but then I was getting garbage positions. So I said, okay, I'm just going to play normal stuff. I still got garbage positions, but <laughs> at least... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. And even if you only play garbage, the last matches, uh, people start to prepare uh, against that. Yeah. Even uh, prepare for garbage. That's a tough spot to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. So, um, so Daniel, uh, Levy was just was just talking to me before about how like the prizes are like quite good in the summer series. Right. And compared to the, compared to the main series, um, the main season of the pro chess league, the summer series, you've got one, one team roster member playing instead of four and you're playing for three weeks instead of 10. Yeah. And yet the prizes are like half as much. So like on the line today for you personally, just in the knockout is going to be, there's like $200 at stake in the, in the four player knockout for you know one hour of of rapid chess for your team there's like you know a couple thousand dollars at stake over the course of three weeks of these matches i mean does that say that maybe you should forget about the garbage for three weeks is that does <laughs> does the money play play a role yeah. in the motivation there yeah i think it's the key and um, for for this matchup you have to prepare the game like in a classical match and go with everything okay Cool. Um, anything you want to tell people about your opponent for this week? You're going to be playing at least at least two, maybe three games against Dimitri Kolars today. Yeah, I I played against him. Uh, I think last last week in Chess.com. It was my last game to reach twenty eight in 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 Chess.com. <laughs> okay. Did you so, make it? Yeah. Yeah. Twenty eight hundred. All right. I, I won against against Dimitri Kolas and then I, I saw that I have to play against him with black also. <laughs> and, really, and probably I will play the same, I don't know, but, but it's a possibility. <laughs> okay, well, when you see his name pop up, you'll think 2,800. So, <laughs> all no, right, okay. have a good match. We're going to give you two minutes to get set and okay. uh, best of luck. Have best fun. Best of luck, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's a two-minute call for all of you as well, that uh, if you want to join these, uh, this, uh, this team match between the Barcelona Raptors and the Bottom Bottom Snowballs, you've got about two minutes to sort out your live chess. And uh, Levy, the format for today, what kind of time control are people going to be looking at if they manage to get in there and register for the match? Yeah, so uh, anyone that's getting in uh, for the club match, which begins in four minutes, it's really not too late to join. Honestly, the fastest way to go about it is, is maybe to just go on the Pro Chess League website and, and, and the Summer Series page, just click it. It does it for you. I mean, it's the easiest and most amazing smart tech I've ever seen. Uh, we've got two rounds of 10 plus two. So you play head-to-head -head against the uh, same level seating kind of across the board. Um, if you guys are fans of, of, of the Bigfoot stream, I think we'll also be, do, we'll be doing a squad stream together because he'll be representing Baden-Baden. Um, the knockouts are a little bit different. They're 15 plus two, but for the fans, those of you that are getting involved, uh, you have to, it, it's 10-2. It's We're following the same kind of battle royale uh, time control that we had throughout the pro chess uh, season. All right, so 10 and two, white and black against one guy from the other team. Get them. Score a point, score two points for your fan club. And uh, then the, uh, the knockout has an interesting format where you play first a 15-minute game, and then if it's a draw, you play a 1-1 bullet Armageddon. It's um, such a big shift in time control, man. It's a big shift from 15 <laughs> minutes to one. It doesn't ease you into it like a speed chess battle where you go like 5-3-1, but you just 15-1 to one right there. They throw you in, you got to do it. Yeah, um, and uh, 
in that uh, in that knockout, there's a pretty important factor, which is who has the draw odds in the Armageddon and who has white in the 15 minute game, and that's going to be based on the fan clubs. And uh, this past week, the the four clubs all gained between 160 and 230 fans, um, which is much closer and more competitive levy than what we saw, for example, in Division A where in the first week, the Pandas and the Archbishops gained like 350 and 390 fans, while the Surfers and Mechanics gained like 100 fans. So those two teams are kind of a global market, you know, globally marketable at this point, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, just just massive, you know, and it looked like, you know, the Mechanics and Surfers would never quite be able to compete with the number of fans that those two clubs were able to generate. Mm -hmm. But here... um, so basically, well, real quick, the advantage that's gained is that uh, Daniel Force and Esteban, his team, the Raptors, gained 230 fans this week. That was the most of these four clubs. That means that every time he plays one of those 15-minute games, he gets white. It means, like, for nothing. It's not like he's giving up draws or anything. He just gets white every game. And then when he plays the 1-1 game, he gets, uh, he gets uh, draw odds. No, I think it's a it's a really unique way to get fans involved, not just voting and you know clicking a button and saying, okay, uh, I'm just showing support for my team, but actually giving them tangible benefit in the match, which it, in any match that they have, any head-to-head in the summer league. So uh, I, I think what fans also have to realize when they watch this show is that it, it's it's not this kind of simple involvement like oh, we're you know we're kind of doing this for you on a very basic level no you actually have a chance to directly affect the outcome of head to head because you give somebody draw odds or you give them favorable uh colors for the for the duration of like the knockout matches for example so uh yeah kudos yeah. i really like it yeah and at a gm level having white every game i mean you know daniel's got to be happy about that we didn't ask him but it's pretty obvious like Um, here he is he's got white here and uh but uh they'll play white and black in this club match but uh to only have white in the uh in the knockouts that's like a great feeling at a gm level yeah and it's uh i do see the game has started maybe daniel wants to get a quick uh quick breather all right he starts with c4 there he goes and uh, actually in division a the uh the mvp the consensus mvp of division a was Rouge and Akobian. He won all three knockouts. Like he played all three weeks and he won all three knockouts completely each time. But, um, you That's know, great. part of that was perhaps that the St. Louis fans gave him white every single game. So you imagine playing three weeks in a row, match after match, and you're only playing white. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of crazy. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a huge bonus. It goes back to exactly what I said. Like uh, St. Louis, obviously at this point is, <laughs> It's a globally marketable franchise. I wouldn't be surprised if somehow they they don't they don't get tired of all these victories in the Pro Chess League and they start trying to build some sort of esports thing there. You know, mm-hmm. they they have they have a ton of support. Their fans are great. Uh, they've got partnerships with the local athletic clubs. You know, like the St. Louis Cardinals, for example, St. Louis Blues, who are the Stanley Cup champions, by the way. Now, so St. Yeah. Louis has it good right now. It's really whatever good. the Stanley Cup is, but awesome for them. So. Speaking about the chess, I think we've uh, we've given the fans enough logistics, but now we can yeah. really begin to jump into the chess. As far as I know, uh, this kind of system for black is actually kind of suboptimal, right? Because white is going to play d4 uh, and and really target the c5 pawn, then the d5 pawn once it becomes isolated, and just has very good central play. At least that's how I've seen Hikaru play about a hundred of these positions. But maybe that's because he's Hikaru. Okay. Well, the detail that that I hadn't seen before, but I was wondering about it as we got to this position, was this move bishop b5 from white. Because I think in this position, before white's castled, if they play d4 too soon, then a check on the a5 to e1 diagonal can be annoying. Right? So they kind of want to castle before they play d4. But as white, you also don't want to play something like bishop e2 and have black play d4 while you're busy castling. Because then you don't get to open up your bishop in the same right. way and get the same long diagonal open. So bishop b5 is played to control d4 while trying to castle. Nothing's free in life. I mean, black could have attacked this bishop and gotten the bishop pair out of things, no? Yeah, he could have. He he totally could have, like, a6, queen b6. Uh, the, you know, the, the downside of moving the a pawn is that white can sort of argue, well, I was going to take anyway. 
So mm -hmm. you're damaging your structure and you're kind of wasting the tempo. The downside of queen b6 is that f6 is always under fire uh, mm -hmm. before you play bishop b7. So really, ultimately, in rapid chess, we we spoke to Daniel Force and Esteban before the uh, you know, before the match began, and he he did mention that sometimes you're you're not going for what's best according to your repertoire in terms of classical chess. You're just going for a playable position. This is just a playable position. So yeah, he's gonna play against uh, he's gonna play against d5 and c5. And so he got he got the move he wanted d4. He's got the bishop on b2. He's got everything. All it cost him was that he had to move this bishop twice. Bishop b5 to e2. Um, Dimitri Kolars didn't try and do anything else more special with that, right? He just, uh, all, all he wanted was to develop all his pieces and, uh, you know, we'll see if he can do anything with that tempo to gain counterplay here with his isolated queen pawn. I've actually been, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a D4, C4 kind of guy, but as of late, uh, I've been having this philosophical debate with myself, it, whether or not I should kind of just play these positions, like the positions where you delay D4, this is, this is modern chess. You, you still want D4. You just don't want it on the first move. You want it like on the ninth move. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the major drawback of playing C4 on the first move is that <laughs> black can just play C5. And now you just have, a symmetrical, you know, symmetrical English, which is essentially taking a nap and going to sleep. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you really want the main line D4 opening, then C4 gives Black both C5 and E5 as options, which sort of change the character of the position and force you into a different set of lines. You have to, I would say to anybody out there wondering about their repertoire and stuff, you have to really like, you know, have some reason why you want to play the symmetrical English or why you want to play C4, E5 to allow this stuff. Just because you see GMs playing one C4 doesn't mean you can just do it if you've only played one D4. You sort of have to have some idea what you want. I have an idea what I want in this position, David. What if I just play bishop A6? Mm -hmm. Like, how, how, how bad or good is the move bishop to A6 in this position? So it my depends idea if you're just trying to win <laughs> frequent flyer miles for your bishop. <laughs> um we can go back and forth between b5 a6 and e2 and really rack them up i know yeah it's like flying round trip but uh my idea was really to to mess up the coordination of of, of black's rook mm -hmm. uh so i would play bishop to a6 and when the rook sure. moves i would play the move h3 okay uh, would the rook go to c7 or b8 in your opinion i was thinking c7 yeah, I feel like I've made some progress if I've made your rook go there because next I can play moves like knight b5, maybe knight e5. Yep. But then again, if I play knight b5, then I can't play bishop b5. So yeah, but I'm okay with knight e5. I'm just not okay with knight e5 at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So he he opts for just h3, h3 first. That makes a lot of sense, right? Because as black concedes the bishop on f3, then he's got his bishop pair. And if black retreats, now he sort of knows what's going on. He could even set up your knight e5 move by playing g4. Well, I didn't think it was entirely unreasonable for black after h3 to play bishop f3 and then c takes d4 so as to kind yeah. of shut out the, the bishop on b2. Um, and then really you can just argue that neither one of white's bishops is that good. Of course, that's a big commitment in the position. So yeah. he might have not liked that. No, I um I would actually expect that reaction myself. Yeah, that, the, that yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say because the bishop on f3 doesn't leave a big impression, but neither does the bishop on b2 <laughs> because yeah. it can't go anywhere. So yeah, these sort of double isolated queen pawn positions, in my experience, are not not particularly bad to play against the bishop parent. Like Yes, the position's not completely closed, but it's also kind of static, and there's possibilities to find good posts for the knight. So I don't know what your thought is, but in my experience, it's not too bad to have two knights against two bishops with those no, pawns. No, absolutely not. Furthermore, yeah, we actually see it happening now. If you keep the bishop on h5, really the only thing that you're doing there with the bishop on h5 is arguing that you have kept your bishops. Uh, because at any moment, as we see in the game, I can play a move like knight e5, and I'm making you make a tough decision. If you continue to just argue that you want to keep the bishops on the board, which you, we see doesn't do, uh, like with bishop g6, there's always bishop b5 coming. So now he has to spend another tempo. And yeah, now white gets this seemingly advantageous knight transfer to potentially either a d4, f4, even g3, f5. Right, also possible. So this, is, this seems like an intelligent plan. Um, I like what he's done. 
I like knight e2. So I don't if know. Black traded on e5 now, the knight would pretty much have to go to e4. Um, because if it goes to d7, there's queen d5. So it would pretty much have to go to e4, and then white would follow up with knight f4. And it seems like black just could not deal with the pressure on d5, like immediate disaster. Yeah, it's it's completely impossible to defend. Knight, knight takes e2 might have been missed. That could have been that could have been something. But mm -hmm. uh, well, hey, maybe maybe Daniel Daniel sees that his team is also out to a very hot start. They're up seven three at the moment, so that's that's impressive. I'm I'm impressed that wow. that many that 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 many things have you know concluded. <laughs> that many games. Yeah. Have, people are playing these like like their bullet. Yeah, I mean, one pair of players have finished both of their games here, uh, Tatu and Sarveshner. So amazing. Yeah, fantastic start for Barcelona Raptors. The other little thing thingamajig about the scoring is that, uh, as, as the snowballs get their fourth point, is that the Raptors, by having more new fans this week, and you know, they had 230 to bottom bottoms, 212. By having more fans, they have a kind of like draw odds in this live chess match. Now you may say, when would a match between, you know, 20 amateurs and 20 other amateurs end in a draw? Mm -hmm. But we actually had a draw last week. Well, there we, you had go. A, we had a drawn match like 22 to 22 um, between San Fran and St. Louis. So if the, if the match ends in a draw, there's a special rule that the team with more fans uh, this week gets two out of three points and the team with less fans get one, gets one out of three points because otherwise the win would be worth three points in a team match. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that was a very good, <laughs> that was a very good kind of transition. Yeah, if you don't think that uh, these matches are drawn, we had one literally last week. Yeah. That's, I don't know if that was collusion or if that was just a nice coincidence. Uh, I mean... As, as also manager of the San Francisco Mechanics, which needed to like win to try and get second place, uh, there was no reason to like collude to not get into the Summer Series Championship. <laughs> that is very true. I apologize. No, no, it's cool. It's cool. I like I like Queen D6. I think Queen yeah. D6 is, an, is, is another intelligent move. And now... Yeah, I he think... had to he had to back up that knight, right? Because it was also going to come under pressure along the C file. Yes, and there was no there was no tactical solutions like with DC five. I think the other point now White is making is that if I play C takes D four now with Black to try to make you go E takes D four and block out your own bishop, which also actually doesn't look entirely bad because White's knights look very good. I think the point is that you have this in between move. You can take on C six, and you force Black to recapture, like let's say Knight C six, Rook C six, and now mm -hmm. a piece will take on D four. And so white gets the perfect setup either with queen or bishop where you can take c6, etc. But uh, you get the perfect anti-isolated pawn position, right? Where you have the piece blockade and you're fighting for actual real pressure on the on, on the weak pawn. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's smart. I like what he's done. Not to mention the possibility of some tactical cheapo involving queen g7 mate. Yes, exactly. At some uh, point. In the club match, we would probably see that. Uh, probably with this head-to-head -head battle, I'm, I'm assuming Dimitri Kolaris will will not will not have a game like that. Um, but yeah. on first board, we won't see Queen G7 mate. But having said that, uh, Dimitri also had probably the most shocking game of the entire Pro Chess League Finals. I'm not sure if you remember that chat, you as well. Uh, I watched it live from <laughs> from the little from the little VIP balcony. <laughs> He was up nine points of material against yeah. Julian Perleko and yeah. he plundered a rook, which was also a knight that was a fork of his king and his rook. So in yeah. two moves, he lost all his material. All. So, yeah, that was uh, that was impressive. And then, yeah, I mean, he managed to basically like get into a completely lost position from being up like ten points as like a GM. Yes. Ten, ten points of like material. I mean, GMs don't even count material like that, but. Um, but he did, and then I think he swindled a draw eventually. But that game was just ludicrous. Yeah, that game made me made me like reconsider my chances of not becoming a GM. I was kind of <laughs> I was kind of remotivated at that moment. Like, okay, if this can happen, then then I can also do it. And then later, you know, things like Alexander Grisha playing Bishop H six against Fabiano Caruana. So, uh, all right, let, let's let's. 
let's check back. I'm going to quickly check back in here on the on the score. Okay, it's 10-5. Barcelona holding on to their early lead. Yeah. Uh, David, do you think these club done. matches are a game of runs or are they a game of matchups? Like, will a team jump out to a five-point lead and then the other team kind of fires back? Or is it just sort of one, once you're out ahead? Rarely. Rarely but we have seen it. For example, the drawn match from last week was a match like that where one team would go up like three points and the other team would like catch up or go up three points. And it went back and forth like, you know, 15 times. And it was like crazy because I hadn't really seen matches like that before. More commonly, what happens is that the team that has more players will have sort of like a rating advantage on the bottom boards. And, you know, if they've got 1,400 players playing against 1,000 players, they'll kind of like score just massive numbers of points there very early on because those games will also be played the fastest. Mm -hmm. And so they'll get like a 5 to 10 point lead and then it'll just continue to grow over the course of the match. That's more common. Uh, someone in chat asking, how are the team scores going up? What are you guys talking about? Like, well, I only see one game on the screen. Yes, uh, so this is, this is kind of the, the matchup of the Titans. We like to focus on this matchup. Uh, before we look, look into some of the other games, uh, there are two games played of 10-2 in this format. Right now, yeah. as, long, as long as you're in the club, uh, you can uh, check out some of these games, right? So Yeah, I'm calling one up as well, just so that everybody sees what we're talking about, because there's an interesting end game between J0411 and Wald Lichtung. These guys are on board three. Um with uh, with Jay representing the Raptors and Waldlichtung with the German flag representing the Snowballs. And um, yeah, I mean, you can see White's played a very, very classic G4 move in this kind of an end game to get rid of back rank mate for the King, but also to sort of undermine the advanced pawn structure and allow the White Rook to get some work done. Black was going to win back the Bishop all along, so White knew that it was Rook endgame time. G4 is a nice move. It's a very, very high-level move. So it's, it's a nice move to see from your board three. Yeah, that's 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 the kind of move. Uh, I've played in team formats a lot. You know, in the in the United States, we have this kind of big annual team event, uh, the Amateur Team Championship, where your the average rating of your four players needs to be twenty two hundred or lower, uh, and that 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 is a fun but also a stressful format, David. I'm I don't know. Have you played in like the Amateur Team West, for example? I have. Where, yeah, it's uh if you come in just to play for fun, it's one thing. But when you're trying to win the whole thing, it it gets stressful watching what your teammates do one on one and head to head matchups. Yeah, I mean I never played in those in the amateur team when I was younger and maybe a little bit more stressed about competition. I only played in it as sort of an elder statesman of the chess world. <laughs> and uh by then I had that attitude you mentioned of just sort of having fun and uh you know, being being relaxed about it, just play some moves, see what happens. So I didn't I didn't get too stressed about how my you know boards three or four were doing. But uh, what do you think of where this end game is going? Wald Lichten going after the C pawn because he just couldn't hold together the king side. Is this uh, yeah, should be? Should, well, I guess the, the question is, can can White win this easily, or can White win this with a bit of a headache? Uh, and I think I think it's just it should just be easily winning mainly from the perspective that as you take these pawns on g7 and h7 you can totally help yourself to them because even though the pawn can promote itself on c1 uh rook c7 check is always a problem so black will have to spend at least one move moving the king either backwards to completely cover c7 or forwards to always have the king defending the pawn if you know the king has to march but yeah White does have the time, right? White can White just has to not panic. And sometimes that does happen. You get to this yeah. two minute, one minute mark, all of a sudden you malfunction mentally and okay, he's not doing it yet. He's very confidently. He can even take that next pawn, I think. Should yeah. not be a problem. For a second, I was thinking that if black instead of rook d3 played like king d6 and took c7 away, it would be pretty hard to control that pawn. But then I noticed that like white's f pawn is not very far behind black's c pawn, right? Yeah, because I mean, once White takes on G seven, that pawn is just as far advanced as a pass pawn. So, even if it were like a race, the F pawn can I can kind of hold its own. You can use it even here, like F seven, F eight, to get room for Rook C seven, if that's what you're worried about from Black. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, I think the most clinical finish here would just be F seven, F eight, and even though you're giving away the pawn, you cut the Rook, up, you cut the King off on the last row, and if you put the Rook on this magical square that you just said, C seven. 
I can't move my pawn, I can't move my rook, and I can't move my king off the file. This is another wave. <laughs> oh, he he wants to play f7 and keep that pawn, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And he's also going to queen with check. So even though he, he would queen second in this variation, he would still be completely fine. Right. If this happened, just showing a variation, folks, he lets the opponent queen first, and then it's not even about his two pawns. It's about this check, which would lead to forced mate. Yeah, that's undoubtedly the fact that there's just not enough airspace for that king to run around. It can't go to the C file because of different x-rays. Yeah, king E6 is what I thought might happen in rook D8. But uh... So now he's corralled the C pawn, and he can go on to win easily with the connected pair of passers. Let's, uh, let's head back to Dimitri and Daniel mm -hmm. on board one here. And uh, Esteban using this weak square on F5. One of my pro chess league lessons was about an exchange queen's gambit by uh by uh Finns mm -hmm. Bartholomew where he uh where he had this like light sword bishop trade and got his queen to f5 and it was just such a nice square to be in. I think black had also played h6, which further weakens the f5 square. And uh, this is a very, very strong square to have your queen on on the white side of the exchange uh queen's gambit position. I was actually curious a few moves before we a few moves ago before we went to this uh fan game if if it was worth for black to weaken his structure by playing a move like g6 to just disallow anything to come to a five obviously yeah. that nothing is free you'd weaken your dark squares considerably but it seemed like it was a smart investment but okay you have to make decisions in chess one of the things that i concluded in that pro chess league lesson which um you guys can all check those out on the pro chess league youtube channel but one of the things i concluded is that it's important for black to play g6 very ah. early against this queen you can't really tolerate it it may look like it weakens the bishop's diagonal from b2, but uh, you, you can't just let the queen hang out there forever. The pressure just gets worse. So It looks like I, I either watched your lesson or I'm somewhat... Or you do it all anyway. <laughs> you don't need any lessons. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I don't play the queen's gambit declined uh, with black because oh. I feel as though it's a, it's a self-loathing opening, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I like more dynamic chances where at least I'm playing for three results, maybe four, the fourth, including just forfeiture and getting angry. Um, mm. But you do play the Caro as black, or you did forever. Oh, yeah, I, I do, and I love it. I won a nice yeah. game recently in Vegas. The Caro Khan is, is a little different. I, like, I, I feel as, as yeah. though it's solid but interesting. Whoa. Okay. Oh, but like something to C6 is certainly coming, no, in this position. It could. I mean, let's see. Rook C6, queen takes on E5, maybe, would simplify some things. So the knight comes to C6 instead. David, what about knight A7? No, could he just win a pawn on A7? Just win a pawn, yeah. <laughs> just take the A7 pawn. He must think he's playing like a winning tactic here or something, right? Like if queen takes E7, he's got knight D5, which is uh -huh. devastating. Um, and if rook, he's got... Oh, no, he doesn't have rook C6. I still thought he had the C6 square. <laughs> right. Okay, so... so he's still got knight D5. If knight takes, he's got mate. If queen takes, he's got rook to c8, uh, c8 check. Yes. And uh, the knight on f6 is going to be overworked, whether black blocks on e8 or plays king g7. That's nice. Yeah, as long as knight takes d5 is working, this is, of course, the move to consider. Oh, it's actually a, a fantastic game from Daniel. I mean, from start fantastic. to finish. Yeah, it's just a great game. It, it shows happy. you how like a GM can play a rapid game that just looks like a tournament game. Yeah, just sim I mean, simply effortless. Uh, but here, maybe knight f6? I, I was going to say, yeah, knight f4 also. Oh! Yeah. Even more vicious. That's just the end, right? That's a yeah. nail in the coffin. Yeah. Attacking the rook. It can't move without losing the queen. If the queen's trade, knight e6 is checked before recapturing. Very, very nice. Um, there is nothing here. Absolutely there is nothing, nothing, nothing. nothing. I'm not even sure why he's thinking. I mean, you, you, I was I was going to say you can also play a style points move like queen takes d7. Oh, that's <laughs> why he was thinking. Yeah. I think, I think when someone's in their best form and when somebody's like playing their best chess, it's when they're in that mode of uh, trying, to, trying to maximize. I'm going to click over a time scramble for fun before we get into their second game. Sure. We got Bigfoot and Art Vega on board two with, you know, eight seconds against 18 and a queen and pawn ending. All right, okay. Big foot is on the back foot here, being down that B pawn. 
see if he can orchestrate a repetition. Oh, but the queen on d4 is good technique, right? That, That's a good yes. square for the queen. That's a great square for the queen. The king can also run around. You can give up that pawn, but be, oh, this this is lost. Oh no! Whoa, whoa! Why give it? Whoa, <laughs> David. <laughs> I don't know, man. The queen was on the perfect square. Is that what you're complaining about? Yes. He, he, oh, my goodness. What what has he done? I don't know. Don't go queen c2. Just please don't go queen c2. Just keep in mind he's not a GM and he's got 10 seconds on the clock. Oh, but he played so well. He got his queen to the best square. Just b3 now, I guess. I, I don't know. Queen, he give did him. get his queen to a good square, and she's back on it. But the problem is the white king can now stop the b-pawn himself. And that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate about queen and pawn endings is that you actually want your king to come out and stop past pawns yourself. Oh, wrong direction to D1, right? Yeah. After, you yeah, want to go to B1. You want to get in front of that pawn with your king. If the pawn gets to B2, it should be lost. I, I feel like the, the geometry of the position is not optimal for a perpetual, right? Because now yeah, I mean, B2, you still got the long diagonal, and that pawn is so close now. Like, for, for example, a move like queen C2, I feel, would certainly be worth a try oh he's queen great. takes queen Queen takes queen hello that was covered all right and a big win for art vega there and the queen and pawn ending we learned a few things to do and a few things and a few don'ts at the same time um bigfoot obviously part of our stream squad so um and he's going for bottom bottom here um and then art vega i just want to shout out art vega who won this game like he played in basically every match in division a as well so this is like this is an involved fan. This is somebody who's in the competition for the best fan prize. You know, always up on the top couple boards, playing every team match. Yeah, that's a uh, an interesting mindset. He, he's not he's not loyal to one club. You know, he's kind of like a he, he, a bit of a lobbying fan. Happy to represent everybody at the top, and if he gets it done, he gets it done. Yeah, he's yeah. There's a lot of people out there who just like to play chess, and uh, you know, if he's got to help, like. A different team today or tomorrow so be it um so back to back to the raptors daniel force and esteban is playing like a pawn centralist defense to the Rui lopez and i'm i'm not sure i'm familiar with this position are you levy no not really uh i'm i i am not a a Rui lopez uh kind of aficionado for either color but actually a while ago, when I was considering adding different tools to my repertoire with the black pieces, I did come across this this line with with G6 because obviously, when you learn a brand new opening, especially when it's as complex as the Rui Lopez, you you need placeholder variations that you play uh -huh. as as you slowly pick up the theory elsewhere. So I did look at yeah, G6, totally. but yeah, this was my problem with it. It's like you you suffer from these central explosions. Like white doesn't need to play castles and c3 d3 like white just goes directly at white you. just goes c3 d4 here and now basically black's not in a position having spent time on g6 they're not in a position to play d6 and sort of hold the line on e5 white's right. got too much pressure against e5 and on this b5 to e8 diagonal so instead black concedes the center and now it's sort of more like the grunfeld style of play right where you're like well i fianchettoed my bishop you know maybe will fianchetto both bishops even I've given up the center, but at least the G7 bishop has a diagonal to put some pressure with. Yeah, it's it's really tough for me to draw a comparison here like to one specific opening. It almost feels like it's a fusion of some like little Grunfeld-esque, right? But we never actually push the D pawn, so then it's kind mm -hmm. of King's Indian-esque. But yeah, we, we don't really... We didn't trade the right central E pawn, like, in the... You know, unless... It was a Benoni esque, right? So I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just the position. Let's just play. Yeah. So I suppose, I suppose, if instead of C six here he played C five and White didn't take on passant, you'd be very close to a Benoni, right? Yes, because then um, it would be E six and then E D five, C D five. Yes. So you're pretty close to that. But I, I didn't mean like, like the positions out of the right, group. Right, right. I meant the sort of general like idea, like, hey, I couldn't hold the center or I didn't try to. But yeah. as the other player took over the center, like at least something became soft, so I had some pressure against it. Yeah, uh, and now know, it's back to looking like a Rui, frankly, right? Because he's got this isolated d6 pawn that you do see Black often pick up in the Rui. Yeah, uh, it's 
sometimes it's counterbalanced by like a weak C pawn or a weak E pawn, or like we saw, you know, sometimes uh, in the last game, both players have isolated D pawns, but definitely, definitely happy with White's position here. But the, the way Black will try to offset the fact that he is deficient in certain areas, like with this weak D pawn, uh, is by trying to play dynamic chess. So he's right. going to put his rooks on C8, E8, hit the center, look for some tactics like maybe H5, Knight G4, something like this, D5 at a right moment to get rid of his weakness. Yeah, absolutely. Really? If you can if you can put enough pressure on E4 that White plays a move like F3 or something, and then you just play D5, it can be very good for you. And anyone wondering, as I was at first, you know, I saw this position here for for Dimitri, and I thought, why not just play like F3? Like you Ooh, want David. that E pawn. David, I have I have a crazy suggestion. All right, tell us. Knight G4. Knight G4 hanging your knight. I like it. All right. Yeah, but the bishop so, is also hanging. So knight G4, bishop G7, queen H4. Okay, so bishop takes g7, hoping that you recapture and win the knight for free. Now queen h4, threatening h2 and f2. Am I crazy or am I a genius? Or, Very you know. difficult to defend both. The best kind is a crazy genius. Let's see about this one. What about h3 in response? Right, I was looking at a move just kind of ignoring... So let's say I play, what do I have here? Can I go for something like queen f2? Mm -hmm. Queen f2, king h1. Oh, I've got, I'm salivating, David. I've got to have something. Uh huh. I've got to have something here, right? Maybe <laughs> not. Do I really not? Can I just go? Uh, I can't go back to h4, right? Because you have queen g4. Yeah, the queen's threatening to come out here. Oh, do I really? I feel we got to play a move like knight e3 and then just rook e3, queen e3. I'm not happy with that. Although that might also not be the Daniel's worst thing thinking for a bit here. Barcelona Raptors, for anybody forgetting, Barcelona Raptors account. That means Daniel Forsen today. Um, 93 wouldn't be enough, probably, because you know something would just get traded off, and then the bishop would come out. Um, wait, he's played a move. What has he played? He he's didn't go for it. Seven. He didn't go for it. Sorry. I guess it. I guess it wasn't working. It was tasty, but it wasn't clear. Yeah, that it I would guess, work out. I guess this H3 move was just smart. Maybe there there might have been another way like to just defend the f2 pawn for example and, and just allow queen h2 play a move like queen f1 uh, uh king f1 yeah but if h3 solves the problems then yeah it's not a it, it's it's not so it's not so easy you're right all right i tried and i failed but it's okay that's fine you got you got to try out some ideas to learn some things we learned more by trying that than just by you know playing queen d7 without thinking Chad is claiming that Bigfoot is another winning position, but the last time we listened to Chad, we saw him blunder a queen in a queen endgame. So, Chad, I don't know how uh, how much we can trust y'all. Uh, I like we that. Should, however, we should, however, check in on the scores here before a short break that we're about to be taking. So let's see how the match is going. It's now 12 points up for the Raptors. Um, and there's still, there's still maybe like 8 to 10 games left going on, but it looks like the snowballs are up against like the last the last moments you know like they lose one or two more games they'll be done e6 is what his opponent just played bishop c6 b c6 e6 that looks like a fake tactic knight takes e6 covers g7 and yeah big puts up a pawn so yeah that's 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 not gonna work <laughs> that's yeah. it. a little can... early to say just winning but certainly um certainly white has nothing for their blunder yeah for their investment <laughs> and uh now i guess we'll go to a quick break when we come back we'll see the conclusion of this game between uh grandmaster dimitri kolars and uh grandmaster daniel forsen
All right, welcome back, everybody. I hope you didn't uh, like the ad better than you like us. I really wonder what the ad was. Yeah. I mean, if it was anything, uh, if it was anything chess related, I wonder what what kind of advertisement for chess would you make, like a hype advertisement? I don't know. I'll have to go back and watch the VOD to uh, <laughs> to watch the ad. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be like some sort of cool new i, I want to see a pro chess league advertisement like a global pro chess league advertisement you know how they do like the over like overwatch or some of these video games and then ultimately they advertise like uh a laptop for example like they you know they need the best gaming software and the best gaming hardware right they should do the same thing for chess and then we'll be like if you want to win like in the pro chess league you need a professional mouse yes <laughs> <laughs> see georg meyer just uh oh wait. Meyer. david yeah I'm going to I'm going to hit you with another idea. Knight f5? Yeah. All right, hit me with it. I What's the idea? So so knight f5 looks really good. <laughs> I don't know. Right. That that looks better than my first idea. All right, we say check, he runs away, we get the d6 pawn. So let's say that black says challenge accepted, takes your knight. E pawn comes up, kicking the knight. Um no, rook c3, buddy. What are you doing? No. Well, this is also the guy that lost 10 points of material, so I guess he didn't want to lose three more. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. The insults are coming out. Levy's not happy. <laughs> Levy is not happy with uh, Dimitri's style here. He's going to he's gonna let him have it like that. Wow. Oh, Dimitri, what is, what is Rook C3? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I got I to gotta check his elo. Give me a sec. Isn't it a two-results move, Levy? It's a six-results yeah. move at this point. <laughs> I don't even got the idea of rook d3 or of rook e to c1. I don't care about his ideas. Look at knight, knight f5. What, what, okay. What All right, we'll go back, guys, and we're just going to look at knight f5 instead of looking at the game because that's what that's what Levy wants. So let's say this knight moves away so that, so as not to uh, so as not to lose the material that's just been gained. Knight to c5. What do you want next? F6 or queen g5? God, they, they both look so good. I, I, I don't know, David. <laughs> Can I get both? Like, I think the answer is F6. Yeah, F6 uh, is very nice. F6. On king F6, you've got queen H6, and the king is caught between the rook on the E file, and I guess the queen is the hard place now. And, uh, yeah. David, I mean, the, so. guy, the guy is at his peak. He is a... He's a 20-year-old grandmaster, right? He mm -hmm. might be in university or, or what have you. Uh, clearly studying chess, playing it very active. In the past year, it looks like he's played over 100 FIDE games, and he doesn't play the move knight f5. Yeah. So there's, no, there's actually no defense to this f6 move, right? I mean, the best move for black might be king g6 after f6. I'm just going through some variations while you rag on him. Um, and after king g6, white saws bishop c2. King g6 is trying to try and keep the white queen from getting to g7 mating. But uh, yeah, it's just winning for white, I think. Knight f5. You were right, Levy. Now, David, I will also say this before we move on from the move knight f5 and a missed opportunity. Chess players are very sensitive people. So I just want to apologize to Dimitri and uh, the Baden Baden fans. If any of you watch this uh, and say, oh, that, that commentator would have never played the move knight f5. <laughs> lowly I am. I'm sorry. But. I think the knight of five was a good move, and I'm going to argue yeah. that now. Same like in basketball. I don't. Are have you going to gonna apologize that. or rub salt in the wounds by saying you definitely would have played knight f five? It's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, David. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of both. Little because bit. you know, I would have played it too, Levy. I mean, I wasn't even looking at the position. I was just looking at your face and like chatting with you about, you know, what a chess ad would look like. But out of my peripheral vision, I was like, I would play knight f five here. That's why when you said you had an idea, I you know I knew what idea you wanted to talk about. Oh, well, we didn't get it. Instead, Dimitri is doing to his opponent exactly what was done to him in the previous game, which is a small positional advantage, right? So he's small grinding it. Advantage. So I mean, this is still like a horror position for Black, in my opinion. Even without Knight F5, I don't know. It's like Black's got to deal with Knight F5 for the whole game, right? Plus, he's got to deal with the C file and the D5 square and the D6 pawn. Yeah, he's he's got some big problems here. Of course, all end games are bad for Black. Black would like to trade a lot of pieces to get into a potentially holdable knight end game. Of course, a yeah. rook end game would be holdable. Uh, if you just had a rook on the board, it would be unpleasant, but it would be holdable. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you gotta trade. I mean, some even 
even his a6 pawn is horrible right because white controls the c file white could play something like you know bishop b7 and queen c6 or something and it's like already tough maybe queen a7 to grovel so he'll have to he'll have to pick his spot but but wait isn't this just lost like what knight f5 I, again but well, not, 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 not knight f5 but i was thinking <laughs> i guess queen f6 but is there some defense to knight f5 in that position yeah do you want to play queen f6 first I want it all, man. I, I mean, I feel as though there must be some some finish here. Right. We'll play queen f6 first, just threatening knight f5. And I don't know, black plays knight g7 and sacks the f pawn. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say for black here. You, you know, like knight f5 doesn't, does it, does it create a threat? Because queen g7 is not mate, right? So if I play queen f6. Okay with the threat of like, it, you give me a couple moves in a row, queen f6, knight f5, king h7, bishop e6, I gotta play pawn takes e6. Where's the mate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't, it's, can't mate I guess me. it's not mate yet. But I guess in that position, you can play knight takes d6 with queen f7 check. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's over. Okay, so he, he goes this way, trades another piece, because it's gotta be over. So. Okay, so he deals with queen a7 as an annoyance by putting the knight here. But I mean, I think, yeah, I think somehow Dimitri's like very focused on the simple way of winning this, and he's not looking at how much he could end things on the king side. But I mean, the simple way is not so bad. Like if he played queen e3 here, even I don't see how black stops rook c6 after a queen trade. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I still just don't see how he's not going to win the game eventually. I know it's... A little bit upsetting that he never played uh, knight f5, but. Yeah, this is still very, very good. Uh, I mean, it would take real effort to lose this or not win it even with uh, with white. Yeah. Like some, you know, if you trade enough pieces, you're still going to have a fantastic position. There's going to be plenty of weaknesses for you to you know fight for. And uh, the only scary thing is that he's getting a little bit low on time, just a little bit. Not like crazy, but yeah. What do you think of this question? I was thinking the king would go to f1 rather than h1 if it had a choice, just to not have back rank issues and to help control these squares on like f2 and e2 with the king. Yeah, I, I would say that h1 is just kind of the the lazy move. That's not that's not even me like bashing him. You just play king h1. You don't even think king f1. You have to ask like, oh, maybe I'm going to get into trouble a little bit. But okay, I think I would have gone to f1 as well. I, I don't see like how is black going to attack you. Yeah, beats me. Even now, right? How is Black going to attack you? Like, what, what are you going to play next? Okay, Knight G5. Right. What's next? Again, I keep thinking that the way to play this kind of position is Queen E3. Like, if he's going to play C file, if he's not going for checkmate, you play Queen E3, you trade all this, and at the end, like, you're just going to play Rook C6. Is this not enough to win, Levy? No, this is 100%. Yeah, 100% enough. Uh, I guess my only concern, if you play Queen E3 in that specific position, was the move F5, potentially. So takes, takes, F5. So takes, takes, and then F5 immediately. You got, you got to do something, right? Otherwise, you're just going to gonna sure. have a miserable position. So uh, that that's that, that was my thought. So I don't know if that was anything. Yeah. But, uh, is 90, I would have... 93 here? 97, 93? 93 with the idea of knight F5? <laughs> really obsessed with this idea. Yeah. Doesn't All right, like so it. queen F6 was played. Now queen G3. So now he's starting to look at, you know, knight takes h3 to try for a draw at some point. If we're here, knight e3, what's, what's the difference? Okay, he does it. Nice. He does it. That's a threatening move. How is this not completely, completely lost for black? Like, I don't... <laughs> hmm. I don't know. Well, you Rook d1, even? You'd want to go rook c7, but queen e1 takes knight on e3, defends the knight on g5. So something else. Something else. But you know, in that variation, David, I guess it would be a draw, but you can actually play rook f7 at the end of that variation, and then you'll win back. It's going to be the Kamars oh, yeah. all over again. He's going, to, he's going to give up the rook and the knight. Yeah. So, yeah, you can go knight f1. Knight f1 is a possibility, but... Uh, I think I'll just place like queen e5 or something. But yeah, he, of course, is. Yeah, so basically queen f4 barely draws for black at the end of all the sacks. Yes. Otherwise, black would then lose a queen endgame in due course. 
Yes. All right. So knight f1 is played. Is that going to force the queen trade? Can we finally get rook c6 on the board? Nope, not so, yet. Well, the knight is now offside on g5. It went there. Right. Side, so. And he wants to be able to answer rook d8 with knight d5 so that he's the only person with a file. He doesn't want to give black a file too. That that makes a lot of sense. Man, this whole this. game has just been torture. I mean, my my appetite for the G6 Rui uh, has kind of been dimmed by this experience. Yeah, this is this is a very very it's a very poor advoc you know advocacy for this opening. Uh, and look, now he has to play King G1, King F2. So a long long time ago, King F1 was probably the more precise move. Um, I, what I find fascinating is that despite all of this pressure, White has been completely unable to win a pawn. This entire time. I mean, now yeah. he can play ninety five, right? Wait, what? Oh, the rook is hanging. Pardon the me. rook was hanging. Yeah. So still. Look at this. Black, still black no is, pawn. Wait, David, G five and black is just completely fine. What? What is this? <laughs> this uh, is incredible. Whoa. I don't know. Oh, he had ninety six. I think he had ninety six instead of going for all this. But fine. This is this is also okay. Maybe uh, this this actually. Oh, and rook c2 if rook b5. Wow. Yeah, not, not easy to control everything. And Dimitri does not have a lot of time to figure all this out. Oh, taking b2 was smart. He's got the draw. Wow. Amazing, amazing job. Yeah, this is this should not be super, super complex. Of course, with low time, it's it's tricky, but well, that's the old story where uh if you if it takes you too long to win, it can sometimes slip away. Yeah, I mean, he's still now he can continue to torture his opponent with the pawn up end game, right? But he can, but I think now his opponent has the comfort of knowing that it draws within reach. Whereas, like, for the previous 40 moves, <laughs> we pretty much thought it was a one result position. I mean, me at least, I was like, like 10 things could go wrong for Dimitri and he would still win it. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I'm in rook h2. And, uh, I guess if the rook just hangs out on h1, it's going to be almost impossible to get it away. I guess you can play king g2. But then the rook goes to e1. Rook kind of has this, this box. So, well, you know what? I, I'm not. I'm not super comfortable making any claims. Uh, can you just play a move like f5 at some point, or king e5 and f5? Yeah. I think. Um, I think you can also do this thing. Like he could have been giving checks on e2 and e3. That should. That should have done it as well. Mm -hmm. And then when the king comes to the f file to finally stop you, then you play rook h2 or whatever. That's pretty clear. So what is the now, idea here? It's rook g5, rook g5. Uh, oh. I thought the idea was to now play f5, trade the last pawn with the king in front of the h pawn. Uh, this is also intelligent. It's just the fortress defense. Okay. Yeah. He just he literally just can't do anything now because the rook cannot mm. come off the file. And Daniel Forsen look pr looking pretty confident here. Looking pretty confident. And uh, well, now f5 because e5, rook a4. He's hoping to maybe catch actually. <laughs> yeah, even if it takes rook a4, <laughs> that's amazing. Even if it takes rook a4. Very tricky stuff. You can play rook a4 anyway. Rook check, right? Rook check. Yeah. And now he can take on e4 and you can't take back. <laughs> wow. Cheeky, cheeky. Okay. Yeah. To draw. yeah. All right. Well, played it down to the end. Bigfoot got revenge against Art Vega in his second game that I was sort of watching out of the corner of my eye was like a close one as well. Um, Impressive job from, from yeah, Barcelona's the game, team. The game got messy, actually. Like, White got some chances. But uh, but Art Vega just had, like, five seconds against 30 seconds to, like, sort out this whole complicated position. So eventually he fell, and eventually the Bonnebot and Snowballs lost by 40 to 24 to the Raptors. So that's a pretty big margin there. Um and uh, now you can see the first the first points are scored in Division B. That's three points for a match win for the Barcelona Raptors. Um, Daniel Esteban obviously doing a good job of of leading the 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 team today with one and a half out of two. But uh, but the team really coming up big for a fifteen point victory there. Yeah, that's a sixteen point victory. Even <laughs> I think they won. They, they yep. completely completely dominated. Very impressive showing, uh, and well, Daniel, Daniel Force, and yeah, Daniel showing why he's extremely powerful in these in this rapid format. Played played it one very very solid game with White and holding with Black. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll see him Black solidly. 
yes, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, we'll be seeing him go up against the Wonder, yeah, in the in the knockouts later. So, yeah. Uh, Ooh, yep. well, in the well, first round, he'll be up against the Wonder. So um, for those of you new to the Summer Series, when we come back from our break, we'll be on to the knockout phase. So we'll have the four GMs just facing off against each other. The fans can take a break and, uh, and watch the action. And uh, we'll have one more match after that knockout as well. So uh, yeah, don't go anywhere. We'll see you for the knockout in a couple minutes. Yep. most elite event in online chess returns with more than $100,000 in prizes, the Speed Chess Championship is bigger and better than ever. As players try to qualify their way in through the women's and juniors field, we take a look ahead and see who's on deck waiting amongst the seated players. Of course, right there at the top, you have defending champion Hikaru Nakamura. He'll face a familiar cast of foes in guys like Jan Napomniashi, Alexander Grishuk, Jan Christoph Duda, and more. But perhaps his biggest challenger will be a brand new player in the field. Currently the world number three and the top chess player from China, Ding Li Ren at 2809 looks to make his SCC debut a memorable one. Look ahead and mark your calendars for November 29th through December 1st, where the semifinals and finals will happen. You can follow all the action at twitch.tv slash chess, chess.com TV, or go to speedchesschampionship.com to stay up to date with all the latest news and info. Be sure to fill out your fantasy bracket and try to predict who's going to win this year's Speed Chess Championship, and we'll see you on chess.com.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back for the knockout, for the first knockout of Division B. I am, I'm excited, David. Uh, so today, everybody, we are seeing the four Titans, the heads of their teams, kind of their official representatives, if you will. Uh, a little bit different. So we're, you, you just saw Daniel Forsen Esteban going up against Dimitri Kolaris, but actually in the knockout battle, uh, things move around a little bit. Now we introduce all four grandmasters into the mix for today. Well, I shouldn't say all four grandmasters. Maybe some weeks we will have uh, an international master, but people like yeah. to send their strongest representatives. So Daniel Forsen Esteban from Barcelona Raptors is actually going to go up against Awander Liang, who's the up and coming junior talent in the United States. Uh, he's a representative of Pittsburgh today. And we have Dimitri Kolarz on the other side going up against Bragi Thornfinson from the Reykjavik Puffins. Uh, each round will be one 15 plus two game. And as we talked about before the show, uh, in the case of a draw, it's going to be a 1-1 tiebreak that determines a very big shift. Uh, why don't we jump into this beautiful uh, graphic that we made for everybody, actually I should say David made, uh, with, uh, with really just like an in-depth look at the players' history in the Pro Chess League, their current season, uh, some of their best accomplishments. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely how I look at predicting stuff in the Pro Chess League, which may, you know, I often get things wrong, so is what it is. But um, I was really impressed with uh, Dimitri's experience this past or performance this past season. I mean, he also played like almost twice as many games as everyone else because his uh, bot and bot and snowballs made it all the way to the final match against St. Louis. So he racked up like a ton of experience. And I would also say his performance rating of 2,600, he's actually worth even more than that because in the playoffs, you're playing all against other people who've overperformed, right? You're playing against people who've performed like you know, 50 to 100 points stronger over the course of the season than their ratings. So even though he played well, his performance rating during the playoffs went down from like 2640 to 2600. Um, so I think he's really worth a ton, or I, I thought so before Daniel Force and Esteban beat him uh, today. But I was expecting that Dimitri Kolars would have the edge in this knockout because of the form he's shown this year. Who, who, who do you think... Um, now that we've seen Daniel beat him, who who do you think has the best odds going into this knockout? Uh, well, yeah, it's 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 really interesting because on the on the classical side of things, obviously, I think of of, of these four players, it's it's got to be a wonder. I mean, a wonder is, potentially can be a future twenty seven hundred rated player, just mm -hmm. even in a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, but having said that, in this format, yeah, like you just said, Kolars is extremely experienced. He has more games played in the twenty nineteen season than. A wonder had in the two seasons that he even played so uh right so it's you know and even he lost to esteban uh but if i have to choose one um i'm gonna go with my boy i'm gonna go with a wonder liam a wonder okay i mean obviously if 2018 a wonder showed up today 2018 a wonder beat hikaru nakamura and had a performance rate or higher than dimitri so we see what what the possibility is there for a wonder as well as you know he's young he could be improving even over that you know, I wonder just how to played in the U.S. Championship uh, just recently. Uh, he's played in many of them, but just in, in the most recent edition in 2019, if anyone doesn't know, he actually defeated Wesley So in a, in a classical time format. So the kid's good. <laughs> the kid's yeah, good. yeah, yeah. That game was really impressive from the U.S. Championships. And uh, uh, a wonder is going to also have the obstacle of playing black in – both 15 minute games in this knockout, no matter who he plays in the first and second round. Well, I mean, we know who he plays in the first round, but uh, his, uh, his Pittsburgh pawn grabbers gained the least uh, fans in their fan club uh, this past uh, week. But um, that's partly because, or maybe largely because their fan club was already the biggest. So a lot of people who were already fans of them had joined their fan club before the summer series started. They actually have the biggest fan club but the least gain this week. So I guess you can't rest on your laurels in the summer series. Yeah, no, I mean, you absolutely can't. Uh, they have uh, one of the, probably one of the, one of the biggest fan bases in, in the entire league. They have a very, very nice Twitter game. You know, the New York, one of the New York Marshals uh, managers also has a strong Twitter game. We were trying to make a big statement on social media over the course of the season, but Pittsburgh, yeah. Pittsburgh's up there and they're very sassy online and we kind of go back and forth and it's fun. I think it's all fun. It's all good. And it's great for the league. I mean, it's the, it, it, it makes things more exciting. And I think talking a little bit of trash, whatever your style is of your team, I think for New York, it was being a little bit more brash 
talking, you know, a little, little smack, backing it up or not, right? Yeah. Um, being humble. What is it? Humble in defeat, graceful in victory, something like that. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost disappointed, actually, that New York is not in the, uh, the league. But in games are underway, so. Yeah. Well, Fortson Esteban, again, thinking 10 seconds about his first move, that whole C4, D4 question. C4 once again. Um, he's got, oh, no. Yeah, he's got uh, he's got white against, sorry, a different game just popped up automatically. He's got white against uh, a wonder. So here's a wonder's first black to to survive or or to thrive. I predict B6. I predict That's a B6. good prediction. I, uh, he might not go for it, but a wonder has been dabbling in these kind of double, okay, he goes for E6. That's also perfectly reasonable. Uh, he he dabbles in these kind of new new double Indian positions where you play B6, yep. G6. Uh, he actually yeah. lost to New York's board one in a, in a, in a head-to-head match, Miranda, uh, yeah. in, in, one of, in one of those systems. But it, it's, it's very trendy now to pin Keto both of your bishops with black, especially when white doesn't play E4. Yep. So I like it. Yeah, First. and uh, we had a junior speed chess championship match with uh, a wonder just, uh, just this past week. And uh, he was playing a lot of B6. So I, I think the B6 trend is, is an interesting choice, especially in Blitz and Rapid. Uh, in Classical, there is still an opportunity for a side to really home cook some good stuff uh, mm-hmm. and not that good stuff, like chess good stuff, and then really detonate it on you in a Classical game. And, and that's where you you know you you can't just weasel out of a bad position because there's not a lot of time on the clock you will suffer for for a while mm-hmm. so these kind of edgy cool new ways to handle positions might not be recommended in 90 30 or two hours which is what we have in the united states but in blitz 15 minute chess have at it do what you want be creative at least that's my mindset mm-hmm. and i would say a wonders position looks pretty healthy to me so far yeah Solid pawn structure, right? You know, um, really. Again, the question is, how long will it take White to play d4? Will he even play d4? Right. That was my question at move ten that I also wanted to ask you. Was like, would you play eleven d4 for White here? Just say like, hey, at some point, if I want to do something, I got to do something. Well, actually, with this move, Rook a d1, isn't that almost the proclamation that you will not play d4? Because C4 will always be weak. Like, if you were going to yeah. play D4, wouldn't you play Rook C1 and then Rook FD1? Yeah, yeah. D4's gotten a lot worse here um, because basically the C pawn's always going to be hanging. So, okay, so he's doing something else. Knight H4, a wonder does not look weak on F5 or G6. So <laughs> this move doesn't do much for me just yet, but uh, I think uh, Daniel's going to show us a different way to handle these positions, basically. I mean, I, I'd be very happy to be a wonder, but maybe maybe we're going to learn something. I, if, we, if we just take a position back for a moment to around move eight, mm-hmm. uh, th- this approach with taking on c4 and then playing a pawn to c5, uh, it, it's, it's extremely, extremely good. Uh, I've seen it you know, in, in a lot of these kind of weird fianchetto positions on the queen side with white, where you can also play moves like queen c2, and then have you ever seen like this G4, H4 approach from white, just like barbarically charging the king side? Uh, it, it, it is playable. But black does a very intelligent job to just take C4, play C5, and you wait for a minute to commit your B8 knight. In a lot of positions where you move the knight to C6, uh, you don't support the knight on F6, and ultimately you don't support H7 as much. It's kind of nuanced. Like... <laughs> I, I, I deep dove into this with a, with a grandmaster for about an hour uh, in, a, in a study session. And he was like, yeah, this is why, you know, in my mindset, you delay the movement and then you see what white does. Well, nice. We see it paying off here. Black is that's very some, solid. That's some intense, that's some intense professional level stuff. But um, I think something that all our viewers can take away with them is the idea that sometimes just taking on c4 when white has to capture with a pawn instead of a piece can be a very nice way to transition this you're taught to capture towards the center not away from the center um so you know here black's giving white this sort of extra center pawn in a sense this sort of central pawn majority but you can just play this dc bc c5 if white ever plays d4 to use the central majority black's well placed 
to trade it and give white, you know, an isolated pawn or hanging pawn. So um, very, very nice option to know that this is one way you can transition the position. I quite like this this transition from a one zero ninety eight, basically asking why why exactly did you put your knight over there, mm -hmm. uh, and what what are we going to get bishop b seven queen b seven and let's just say the knight comes back to g two, what is what is the plan there for a wonder because if I'm playing white in that position I'm looking at moves like f four, to take some space corral the some of the central dark squares. Okay. Um, well, I often get this stuff wrong, Levy, but I was thinking that he might be considering a reorganization as well with bishop f6 and knight to d6 as to where those two pieces were going. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe putting the knight on f5. Got you. And what if I'm just like brute force? I guess the big question is if I can go e4. Like I push pawn e4, pawn f4. I'm trying to suppress your knights. I know I'm giving you the d4 square for the bishop, but then I can just play king h1 and sort of trade off your bishop and argue that I have a, a massive pawn center. How are mm -hmm. you going to get a knight to d4 with that setup? I'm just curious. Not you, a wonder. Or you. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Me playing a wonder advocate here. Yes. Um, yeah, it's not going to be easy to get a piece to d4. Maybe once white plays f4, I'll play knight to b8. With uh, the, David, uh, with speaking the of knight. f4, I don't mean to cut you off, but we actually have it on the board now. Wow. Well, that's 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 something from uh, from Mr. Forsen. F4 immediately. He wants that space, and uh, he doesn't care about a possible doubled pawn on H4. He said, "Well, maybe maybe you're used to threatening Bishop takes H4 and in speech as people just retreat the knight." But you know, here's my treatment of this position. That is a fascinating idea. So he is completely not concerned about damaging his king size structure because he thinks that with moves like King H1. Uh, He's just going to launch a big attack. He'll get knight e4, f5. Wow. That's exquisite. You know, your opponent retreats, so you keep marching forward. You push the pace on him, f4 immediately. Right. You don't make any concession. <sighs> yeah, I guess the, that's, that's deep. Yeah. So rook d1 is just to babysit the d3 pawn once he starts attacking on the king side and ignoring the center. That was the idea with rook d1. I mean, it's really quite a deep approach. F6. Yeah, I wonder now doesn't want to get caught too off guard. But the tough thing here is he's already at a two minute disadvantage. Mm -hmm. and so what happens is like you, you get surprised by a move and it might be a really, really nice idea. So you try to play fast because you don't want to get in the tank. The worst thing in these kind of situations is to be down five, six minutes, which is already half the time format. Uh, yeah. But that might mean you don't play so precisely. Like the bishop on F6, I'm thinking could be a target for some of these pawns. Um, you want to go g5 without playing g4 bishop takes h4 probably yeah my students would do that at this point they would play like g5 and then you know i would say that's illegal so they would put it back on g3 and then a keen opponent would go touch move so you got to go g4 boom Oof. tears 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 that'd be rough <laughs> instead he just comes back knight f3 and if he wanted to play f4 he's basically played it for free because a wonder played knight e8 in the meantime right i mean he moved his knight back and forth but you know, Wonder still has to reorganize his pieces too, and I think G4, G5 is coming. If I if I'm now at a point where I can read uh, what Daniel's up to, yeah, we've got so many options to choose from. You know, I'm not ruling out E4, E5. Of course, it does block out the dark squared bishop, but G4, G5 is begging to be played. Uh, th this kind of basket of pawns: F4, E3, D3, C4, suppressing Black's movement. You can't break in the center with a move like e5 because, well, you give up d5 forever. Uh, yeah, and tough to do. Well, why don't I just play a4 here with white? Really, I don't know. Is, is it necessary to play a4? But I kind of like it. Just cut down all the play. Yeah. I mean, a wonder finally came up with b5. You play a4, and then black's in one of those positions where it's like, what's my next idea? Yeah, you play a6. Right? It's, it's passing the move back. It's, it's waiting for white to potentially mess something up uh i'm gonna quickly on my screen it's not going to change on on yours check in yeah. on dimitri's game no no we'll we'll do it too i i'm with you on that i was dimitri, curious about this sicilian dimitri's just completely winning right i mean he's just have a pawn and black is not castled that's just over <laughs> it's very very bad position i think black was just not super familiar with the opening i think dimitri just 
So, I mean, the big thing that happened was this move 11, black chooses to play e5. Um, you know, other candidate moves would have been bishop d7 or castles. Um, he goes for e5, cracking in the center, um, and Dimitri trades once and hits him with queen g3. So now there's issues on e5. Um, could he have played bishop to d6 there? I wonder. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, I'm not so sure what what was missed. Uh, he could have. I think it was a bit of an opening misunderstanding. Like you're not, you're definitely yeah. not supposed to go for this kind of stuff. I mean, with bishop g4, bishop takes e5, as you say, he's like down a pawn for nothing. Um, yeah, and he's not castled. And he's hasn't castled, or he's you know behind in development, which goes hand in hand with not having castled. Um, so maybe. So maybe the question is why he couldn't play bishop d6. Would the answer be queen g7 maybe? With the knight undefended, why can play queen g7, rook g8, queen f6, pawn takes d4, knight d5. Well, d4 is also hanging, I guess. But yeah, knight d5 also looks like a very, very nice move. And e5 is coming. Bishop yeah. c4 is also coming. I mean, you can't take on c4 because queen d6. All right. White's already up a pawn. Good chance of collecting d4 or getting an attack going. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it was just that. So just e5 is perhaps not playable there. I mean, just walks into a really rough situation. Akalars is just playing cleanup. Oh, oh yeah. On bishop takes f6, he's just going to play e5 now, right? And then e5 it and all queen falls g down. Queen g7, yeah. Queen g7. No, yeah, black just can't it. castle. Yeah, just keep it. Alternative is GF six, and you still can't get the rook or king organized. So, bishop took. Yeah, I mean e five, and also even if you, if you don't play, it's just, it's just very very bad. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean black doesn't have any counterplay or any other thing to do but to. Uh, Give up another pawn without even making a counter threat at, well, at any point. David, it's uh things are happening in, in in the game that is a bit more bit more evenly bit more evenly uh, matched. He didn't yeah. need a four anymore. Force an Esteban G four. I say it like so confident that he knows what he does or doesn't need because I've got this sense like he really really knows what he's doing here. Like he did not come up with this plan during this game. He sort of this is the idea that he that he has in his bag of tricks. Yeah, you know, there is there is definitely a benefit of being an older chess player. Like for example, he is I'm I'm not sure how much older than a wonder he is, but and, 25 to 16. Yeah, well there we go. I mean, that's that's <laughs> that's almost 10 years worth of, of more games potentially. That's like a uh, generation in chess, right? Yeah, so he he's definitely I, I, he's definitely played more games uh, and he might have had games that were similar to this. It it does help. Uh so how do you feel about a wonder's decision to trade off the bishop on c3 versus retreating the bishop? Like, I think that's a moment where a lot of our viewers could have been, if they had this in their game, they might be conflicted for a while. They might burn some clock deciding, like, do I give up the diagonal or do I retreat? And then I'm sort of maybe also giving up the diagonal. Well, the thing is, when you uh, play bishop f6, I think you envision what's going to happen. I think you know that you will be making this trade on c3. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming that's what he thought because f4, bishop, f6, right? And then you're like, all right, well, g4 is coming. So when it comes, I got to do something. I'm not going to go back to e7 because that's why I move my bishop to f6 unless I'm Dimitri Kolars. So then I take on c3. Sorry, I had to get my jab in. Uh, and then <laughs> well, I'm going to make this committal decision and then I'm going to defend my king side as best as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, has he figured out exactly how he's going to do that? Probably not. Uh, okay. That's really tough to do. You know, it, it, you got nine minutes and you're frequently, you know, you're flying around in your head. What, what's my best defensive setup? Do I push any pawns? Because mm -hmm. that's what white's going to do. What's just coming in? H4, H5, G6, H6, whatever. Uh, he I must. Mean, the, yeah, sorry. The only thing I've got on my mind still, Levy, is Knight F5. That's, that's the only thing that keeps popping into my head. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is see. that bad? You mean from the Kalars game? Yeah, ninety six. No, no, for um, 
You mean, or Wonder, Night D6. I, 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 I couldn't tell if we were still making fun of that move or, or if it was <laughs> Night D6. Night oh, because he didn't play Night F5 last time. Yeah, so if you play Night D6, I guess I cannot go E4 because you'll take on C4. This is kind of the base of the counterplay. So if you play Night D6, I, I, I'm just going to continue with my play, H5. You're going to go Night F5. Hmm. Unfortunately, the chess players themselves cannot calculate moving pieces on the board. Uh, right. So I need to cover against knight g3. We do have some moves played, actually. So, you know. Oh, so, yeah. So what actually? You just played knight, knight f8. f8. I don't like that. I think Sergei Karyakin once in an interview said that his opponent played a move, or I think he played a move. I, I suppose the, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a binary thing, right? And he was like, okay, this was basically an admittance that the position is bad. I think knight f8, you are accepting that your position is bad. You are not really fighting aggressively anymore. Uh, you're like, all right, I'm going to curl up in this corner, and if you can't finish me off, then I'm going to come back later and maybe survive. Right. Uh, oh, man, what are you going to do with H5? Yeah. I mean, this also shows how situational stuff is, people, because a lot of times you hear, you know, you hear people say things like, Knight F8, there is no mate. Like, it's like a perfect defensive square. But here it feels like it concedes 95 for white, and it's just too passive. Well, this is the age-old approach in Blitz and Bullet. You trade a rook down the file, you move another rook, and you trade that one too, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I've seen this happen in plenty of games. and Of course... No, no rooks on the board saps a lot of white's potential to attack on the king side. Then it becomes more of just a positional squeeze. Yes. Then you have to rely on the fact that you have good dark square power, right? The dark square bishop on c3 patrols the entire board uh the only thing that you need to work on now is suppressing the, the black queen from getting in uh while you try to counterbalance that with your own aggressive intentions mm -hmm. so like let's say okay rook d8 queen d8 ah, i mean i don't see any anything else you can also play bishop e5 i suppose i mean um, sometimes if you really want to attack you'll see people play a move like rook c1 in positions like this just to like leave a rook on the board even though it doesn't necessarily do anything there um and then later go for the kingside attack. But I don't think white's going for kingside attack anymore. So let's follow your idea. Rook d8. Queen then I was thinking, yeah, we trade and I play e4. Okay, so you want to keep the full bishop pair, huh? I want everything, yeah. I mean, All the space and the bishop pair. So my point is that if you play something like knight d6, don't I have like knight e5 or something with h6? Like, of course, e4 is hanging, so maybe knight e5, right? 95 mm -hmm. would hit your bishop, defend e4. You move, then I play h6. I think I'm like strategically winning at that point. I mean, it, that right. doesn't matter at all. So, and like, I, if I play queen a8 to keep pressure on the center, then knight c6, queen c6, e5 probably loses the game for me instantly. Yes. And like, so, you know, ruling out even e5, like, let's say I'm not allowed to play that. I can only play a move like queen d3. You just have yeah. to suffer forever. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is. I guess a, I guess c4 is a weakness, but it's so hard to get to because your your d6 knight is on the prior. Yeah. So. Well, my idea was that queen a8 would put pressure on e4 to try and really like determine things, but I just I just can't play it. So force in place like this. Interesting. This also makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean he's not in any particular hurry to do those things you did. Those things were good, but. Uh, it's also not like uh, a wonder's threatening anything yet, is it? That's true. Not, I not. did really like to take and play e4, and then ultimately, I'm I'm threatening to maybe just play a move like e5 or f5 in the future to take as much mm -hmm. space away from you as I possibly can. But h6, he's trying to cash in. He's had a great yeah. position, now he's trying to cash in. I mean, if the best response to h6 is g6, then he won't have hurt anything by throwing an h6, then trading the rook and playing e4 kind of like you wanted to, right? So we'll what see if a wonder comes up. Like, why can't you just take on h6? Are you made it? Yeah, you could. I mean, then you have to defend the g5 with the knight to g6, but that's probably where you want the knight anyway. If you put a pawn on g6, the knight on f8 becomes pretty bad. Yeah. So, I was yeah. even thinking to take, take, and uh, yeah, knight g6 is reasonable. I mean, is it ridiculous for me to play him? Okay, I, I mean, I want to stay away from a move like f6, but my idea was f6, queen f7, queen g6. Like something like that. And just kind of pressure you. Or queen f7, queen h5. And I'm actually going to attack the pawn that you put there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, also, queen d7 offers a queen trade. Queen d6 offers a queen trade. Queen b7 maintains pressure on the diagonal. 
everything seems not seems okay for a wonder once he plays f6 you think oh he actually does take oh and there we go it's on the board all right well did it wow impressive right. queen seven, queen six. i like that i like that i like it a lot all right so wonder right. i on the same page that's either a good yeah. thing or a terrible thing <laughs> Yeah, so now we'll see what, what Esteban has in mind here. 95? F6 is something. the last thing that you look at, I think, David. I think something it's kind of aggressive for white needed, I think. Yeah, Can I go what? 95? 95. Can I try that? Okay, someone in the chat is making a point. Okay, Queenie won. I want to go punish you instantly. But let's let, yeah. let let's stick to ninety five, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, ninety five. Sure. Let's stick to ninety five. I don't want to. Okay, I take. Give me. I mean, point. they're trying to play queen g three. I'm playing playing queen g four, which is almost the same. But I'll also attack e six if black plays knight g six. Ah, but, so your point is that knight g six, queen e six will just win a piece. Yeah. Are Are you taking on uh, g two or e five here? No, I'm going to take the knight. I'm going to take the knight. Okay. So then I got to go queen g four. Yeah, now I have to play king f7. Everything else is lost. Yeah, if king h8, then bishop e5 is super strong. That's, you know, the dream to open that diagonal. Right. And uh, if knight to g6, then queen e6 check hits the bishop on c6 and all kinds of stuff. Right. So, king on the run. King f7. Now, I guess I'd probably play bishop takes e5, queen b7. I mean, you could get a b6 or d7. I don't know that it'll matter. Ah, uh, your point. Okay, so bishop e5, and you're saying that it's it's tough for the queen to move. Yeah. Okay, let's go to d7. Sure, d7. Okay. All right. Now, now, what more do I need to make this? What other ingredient do I need to make this work out? You need your bug house partner to get you a knight. I think <laughs> that's I need, what you need. I need a bug house partner here. Yes. <laughs> That's not good news. If I could drop a knight on h8, you're right. That would be pretty sweet. Uh, I don't even know. I, I'll go king e7. I guess you can then play something like queen h4. But then yeah. I'll get my bug house partner to get me a pawn to put, place on f6. But then we'd be watching a Helden Light stream. Then it'll just be all, not, all, all, all madness from there yeah. on. Well, Chad, I know you guys see queen h5. We see it too. But what happens if I just block with the knight? Now there's a big difference is that everything is defended. And you're yeah. just not in time. <clears throat> I just knight g6. So... Yeah. I believe that Daniel's still thinking about this. Yeah, he hasn't figured out what he wants to do yet. So no, it's good. It's perfect. Perfect play from a wonder. He he's Ten, playing twenty six hundred style chess, where you might play something with black, where white tries to pressure you, uh, and you just defend. I mean, it's like literally the art of defense, right? You you simplify the position. The opponent overextends. H six clearly now being shown to be not the most precise approach, or so seen. Yeah. Uh, and there we go. F6, a very nice move. Actually, F6 was the move a wonder played against me in Chicago Open a month ago, which I completely overlooked from a distance, and it just gave him uh, an overwhelming advantage. So there we go. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was ready to concede that in that 95 line, I couldn't break up that king on F7, pawn on E6, um, and uh, Daniel's just played bishop H3. Yeah, you got to do something, right? Your bishops have jobs. <laughs> They're attacking the pawns. Why are Dimitri and Braggy still playing? What, let's see their position. Three pawns up still for Dimitri. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, pretty no, Nothing's like, changed. Right. Nothing's yeah. changed. Still pretty straightforward. Now, I will All say right. this, though, David. I, I don't think that a wonder is any better. <laughs> that is, that is, that I will not argue. I still think that this is, this is a, a relatively complex kind of position figuring out if it's trying to be a middle game or an end game with these minor pieces but uh i mean unless he can get your queen f7 to g6 slash h5 idea and, and show that the h6 pawn is overexposed unless he can do that white still has the bishop pair and the pawn on h6 is a little bit of a thorn in the black king's side i mean it's pretty important whether that pawn dies or annoys all right yeah it's it's, uh, it's getting down to clutch time, right? The last five minutes of the game per player. I wonder, huh? probably quite happy with himself after F6, but he's not out of the woods. He's still has to, yeah. So he's, he, this is a big decision now. He's going for the queen trade. Right. 
he must think that and wow blitzed out all right here we go it's about to get spicy who is better at maneuvering their three remaining pieces all right i mean he's still got knight d6 to f7 as a way to get at that pawn or king f7 to g6 um uh, daniel wants to play knight e4 and go after c5 and f6 so i would suggest not allowing that are you gonna play f5 here I would play either knight d6 or bishop c6 to sub it. Bishop c6, right? And then I, what if I play knight b3? I guess on knight d6, there's bishop f6. So yeah, bishop c6, knight b3. Man, and there's always something to attack, huh? The wonder definitely didn't blunder knight d2. Like, there's no way he blundered knight d2. Okay, king uh, f7 played. David, actually, <laughs> wait, I, I'm thinking, wait. Wait, wait, did it, did a wonder just overlook e5? I'm so confused. He could have played e5? Yeah, I think he instead of king f7, he just had a tactical defense, right? e5. I mean, his position's very passive, but doesn't e5 hold everything preemptively? Mm hmm. It does. I mean, I'm guessing that s that, that Daniel would have just played bishop g2 and kept the kept the pieces on the board. Mm hmm. Right? I mean, he likes to have that bishop pair. And then he gets control of a long diagonal. He's got the idea of bishop b7, as well as, you know, bishop d5 or back to knight e4 and stuff. It seems like there would still be a little bit of pressure on a wonder in that position. Maybe I'm maybe I'm overestimating it, but they're starting to move faster. So let's see, knight e4, knight takes c5, and uh, wonder has lost a pawn here. So he's going to try and win back h6. That was his plan with king f7, I guess. Yeah, this is now starting to blossom into something for white. I mean, the bishops kind of demonstrating the, their mobility, why they're such valued assets in these endgames. Uh, mm -hmm. He has that one knight, basically on what is its best possible square, putting pressure knight, on it. Is knight e4 a good move here? Ah, to prevent knight h6 and also right. hit f6. We've got the knight d6 check threat, and we're trying to tie black down to f6 pawn again. Oh, he played it. Very nice move. And if king e7, bishop b4 is coming. Ooh, knight e4 is... That could get annoying. That's very tough. I have no idea what black should play. Not a clue. I mean... Maybe bishop b7? b7, knight f6, knight e3. Something like that. Yeah, but then... Oh, you don't lose h7. Yeah, I'm, so I'm starting to forget what's defended and what's not. Knight e3, yeah, there's d3, something like that, to hit h7. Sorry, say that again? So bishop b7, knight f6, yeah. knight e3, bishop d3. Oh, bishop d3, yeah. To try and go after that, make something out of the h6 pawn before black collects it. Wait, it's, but you could just play knight f5. It's messy, <laughs> but yeah, black wants to play knight f5. Knight f5, yeah. Right, you we can save that f6 right? pawn, but the knight's awkward on f6 for a moment. A wonder just played bishop b7. He did, he did. Uh, can you go bishop g2? Uh huh. To keep threatening stuff, yeah. Okay, but he he just goes this way to keep the tension and the threat. But okay, no, wait. he's playing like you. So we're gonna see knight f five from a wonder. Like oh, what? C five? I mean, not... you go knight to g four. It's hard to keep track of everything that he could or couldn't do. But I think knight g four is an option. Knight knight e four doesn't look great. Pawn to c five might be playable at some point. For the record, the Dimitri game is still going. <laughs> yeah. He's now yeah. up four pawns. He's about to be up five pawns. One, two, so. three, four pawns. That's heinous. Resignation. All right. That was just too much. <clears throat> okay, back knight to e4. So, yeah. So, restraining that knight on f5 again. But David, who has benefited from this? Losing e3 versus losing f6. Is it white who's benefited or black? I think neither player has particularly benefited from it, but so <laughs> far it's it's prevented a wonder from regaining the pawn he lost on C5. Like Daniels had just enough tactical stuff to keep him from like collecting E3 or H6 for free. Right. Um so I think that was the best he could get out of it. And now, you know, it's a question of Ooh, knight d7 is a good move because he knows he's got to cover the queen side now against bishop b7, knight c5. So that's where the battle is now. I mean, are we going to see something like bishop b4 at some point here? 
seems like c5 is the next battleground square. Yes, bishop c6 is very logical. Now oh. you're basing. Yeah. Yeah. He it's wants them to go to c5 first, right? And then play bishop b4? Yes, and then bishop b4. But like knight d3, I guess. And then what? I'm not, I'm not so sure here, right? Because mm -hmm. f4 is now hanging. Yeah, he may have just discoordinated himself. I it think he's going to sack f4 if he wants to win the game. Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, never mind. All right. <laughs> now Wonders got... Does, does he have time for knight h6? Or is there still bishop e4 taking h7? I mean, maybe just accept you're down a pawn, stop trying to win h6, and just make some pawn trades. But... Oh, I would just blitz out knight c5. I mean, I'm not so sure what he's... What, what can you possibly... Or maybe he's looking at knight b2 or knight d6. Yes, both those moves hit the pawn. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's this is this is very nice. Is there c5 here? Knight c5, bishop b4, and the knights are somehow holding each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'd be pretty tangled at the end, but I think they would do what they needed to. Um... Oh, this is this is great job though. Great job on his part for you know pushing this time time situation. Is he yeah. gonna play king? Oh, he's gonna play king e2, knight d2, and then and then maybe take like on d3 to try. Have to take on d3 to not let the knight come out through f4. Wow, that's a that is a sneaky idea. Okay, so now, knight. I mean, he could just play knight c five, right? He got rid of that c pawn. He's he's almost in the clear. Oh, but his position is still so tough. Knight c five. I can play a move like bishop c three. And where does black move? Black literally cannot move either knight. If I play bishop c three, you can only go knight a three. That is a, well, it's that a good is a, thing he's not the one with 19 seconds, huh? Because that would be hard to to manage that position with the time disadvantage. Uh oh, he's, go, he's going for it. Whoa! Did this trade? Did he did he blunder? I mean, he There's must. No have. way he spent 40 seconds and didn't realize that White could recapture either knight. Is there? I think he has knight h2 here. He has knight h2, bishop h7, knight g4, and he's picking up the pawn. But he has to see that. I think he does. Yeah. There we go. Okay, he he might be in the clear now, but oh man, you gotta still defend the other side of the board. Still not, there's still king c5. Bishop d3. That was smart to play king d4 first. Oh, so much better than bishop e4 to b7 or something. Yeah. Now, well, a5 is, is maybe king f6, bishop a6, king f5, something like that. No, he just goes a5. I mean, so much to calculate here. Such immense focus is required. Yeah, king f6 might have been a good idea. Maybe he would have still had to just play king c5 for white. Yeah, I'm starting to like this. Uh, this is, you know, king and knight versus king, bishop, and pawn is, uh, is, is a tough end game to hold. You would much rather have the bishop versus the knight. Yeah, the rook pawn is going to be like a disaster for that knight to deal with. Um, and that's even if he finds time to trade off the F pawn, which he should be able to, but it might take so much time that he's out of position to deal with the A pawn. And now a wonder himself is down to those seconds. Down to those seconds. Bishop C4 okay. would have been evil, right? With the idea of F5. Yeah, I guess his idea was King F6. Okay, he's getting to that final pawn. He's forcing F5. That's his name, so he, you know, he's following the philosophy there. Ooh, Wonder wanted to counterplay rather than one more pawn off the board. I mean, he just, I guess he just can't deal with the A pawn, huh? And White knows he's got the check and going to C4. Even in the time scramble, he didn't, didn't need to double check that. Can you go for something like 94? Are you in time here? This just looks lost for 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 uh for black it just looks like there is no oh, way man. and bishop d3 the timing's not working out for a wonder here he, that's amazing how well he played to still perhaps lose this game yeah king d4 now oh okay or that is he calculating king, king d4 b7, here? and then when the knight moves king to b8 or c7 yeah this is the final trick but a7 here is just winning. Yeah. Wow, well, he plays it. All right, he's going to get the pawn one square away. Ah, okay, he's going for this one. But, well, I'm not so sure about queen d5. Yeah. kind of did let the knight come forward. Yep. <laughs> and amazingly, he doesn't even have a check afterwards. So he can't stop e2. Yes, I mean, we do know that this is a... Uh, 
This is a winning king in pawn. Wait, knight c2? Yeah, knight c2. Hold on. Did he just blunder everything away? Well, I don't know yet because there's only a couple. There's only they're basically playing bullet now. Wait, this is this is unbelievable. Wait, what? He just queens. Okay. Just block, <laughs> draw. Wow, wow. So we're gonna get an actual bullet game after that amazing defense. Oh my gosh, David, what just happened? What? Hello. I don't know. Oh, David, you need to make a video on how to win like a like up a queen or something. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Pro chess lesson. <laughs> Um, man, maybe queen f3 instead of queen d5. But so you hit the knight, back. and when it comes to d4, you play queen d1 check. Yeah, that would buy you a lot of time. Bad. That would buy that would buy you a lot of time. Yeah, I, I don't think queen d5 was was right at all. I mean, I actually, when queen d5 happened, I I think I actually went wait, allowing the knight to get to d4 was a complete blunder. Like I think actually e2 is coming now. Yeah, and. Yeah, I think now, must, yeah. now tell me, Levy, um, why did he even have to go for a7? Like, couldn't he have just played bishop e2 and then queened at, at, at his leisure? Uh, on king d4, yeah, probably. Uh, David, he could have probably also taken the knight and then queened, and then because he has the advanced f pawn, he's also it's winning. Right. Here, here. Uh, but yeah, bishop here. f1, right? Just bishop queen. one, bishop b2. Just bishop f1, queen. and it's over. Wow, what a game. But they're going to be playing a 1-1 one -one game, yeah? So they, are, they should be. And normally, it just starts like immediately without even a chance to breathe. But I guess this week, they decided to give the players 10 seconds to to uh, to catch themselves. Um. Maybe one of the players wasn't sure about the about the Ar Armageddon rules, so they're just sort of like refreshing the players' minds on it, which is which is fair. I mean, this is a new format. These players have never played mini knockout matches where you play a 15-minute game followed by a bullet game. But uh, you know, basically, it's going to be a wonder who will have white now, and uh, and Daniel who will have draw odds with black in this one-minute game. I gotta give. Uh... I think I got to give the edge here to a wonder. Uh, I mean, I I don't know how much bullet uh, Daniel Forston has the one plays, mm -hmm. uh, but I I mean I feel like in a one minute game after that kind of momentum shift there, it's 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 really it's really a wonder who's going to be pushing the pace with White. Okay, um, I got to see a wonder play quite a number of uh, bullet games. Uh, last week in the uh, speed chess championships and he's quite a fine bullet player he's... this will also be the first time that we see forson playing with with black so let's see if he tries to play solidly or push the pace a little bit now friendly reminder everybody daniel forson for all the games today essentially has an advantageous situation uh, for his his color schemes uh, and the draw odds. So because of the fan vote and, you know, the amount of fan growth that the Barcelona fan club had, so it really has nothing to do with Daniel Forsen. It has to do with their support. Uh, he will have white in the knockout stages and in, well, we already saw him have white in the, the live match uh, for the first game. Uh, and so he will have that advantageous kind of color matchup, but also in this 1-1 one, one playoff, he doesn't get the white pieces. He actually gets the black pieces, but does have the draw odds, which is huge. You have two-thirds of the potential results on your side. I mean, yeah, that's that's amazing. So Yeah, and the first time I was thinking about it, Levy, I was thinking like, well, draw odds, like what percentage of bullet games end in draws? You know, it's not like a 2,700 tournament where 80% of games end in draws. Like if you look at the results in like bullet games online of IMs and GMs, it's like 5% of games, maybe. It's like, you know, not necessarily more than the advantage of having white. But someone else pointed out to me that having draw odds and knowing you have it from the beginning in a bullet game means there's all these scenarios that your opponent can't allow. Yep. Right? So actually, I mean, if you, if you both are playing knowing what you have, you can maybe make more out of it. That is true. Uh, speaking of making more out of something than what you have, what on earth is a Wonders Knight doing on A4? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm very concerned that it will be trapped with something like b5 in the future. I guess hanging out long term is the answer. Oh, this is, <laughs> wait, this is so bad. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Hello. 
something's got to give here. I don't like this at all. Yeah, so, exactly. Now he has to just retreat. This should so be F three from a wonder is getting a no 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 from you. I mean, it's all it's all getting a no no no. That's yeah. F five. That was good. It's like you get nothing now. Here F5. I come. F five. B five. King H one takes away the H one square from the bishop. It might need that at some point. Oh God, F four. He's trapped that knight. That knight is trapped <laughs> again on D one. Okay, he found a way out. Listen. 13 okay. seconds each. No, black is dominating here. Oh, F3 also was, was potentially playable. I wonder it's, just dug out, though, sort of. Sort of, yeah. It looks like a game. I mean, a 10-second game, but a game. Yeah, I don't see any sacrificing you know, pieces. And uh, Takes, takes, knight E2? Or knight B3 is going to get the B pawn. Knight That's knight. That was like the one big idea for... What? He didn't take B2. Yeah, I, I don't know. Hello. <laughs> Hello. That's rook the only eight. idea in the game. Rook A8, Rook A2? Yeah. All you can do is what? take that. What? <laughs> Wait. All right. This is what Bullet looks like, Levy. Okay, but this is a draw. But who's going to win if draw. it's a draw? Black. Black's got draw odds. No wonder he didn't go win the B pawn. And everything he did was he was like, well, I'll just make an opposite colored bishop position. I've got draw odds. See, that's, that's the strength of the draw odds, right? How many bullet games yeah. end in draws? But this one will because he knows it wins for him yeah that's a that's a very very nice result daniel daniel forson is playing with force today uh, he, he's he's yeah. doing a great great job yeah if that were a 15 minute game he butchered it right because he had like an easily winning position he just traded everything off into this opposite colored bishop position when you have draw odds then suddenly everything he did makes sense and so that means that in the knockout stage mr daniel forson will advance yeah he's yeah. gonna play well <laughs> advance to a rematch with dimitri yeah so the, their story is not done uh and it looks like the player who will have white there they, they, it's just a repeat yeah of the ten, of the 10-2 format so it means that yeah. uh daniel forson is going to play white against dimitri yeah, Kolaris. Again. i'm getting some deja vu david i'm getting yeah, I mean, you should have you should have cast the Division A with me. Veruja Nikobian played for St. Louis all three weeks, and they had the most fans all three weeks. So, like, every single game I cast was, like, Veruja has white, Veruja has white, Veruja has white. <laughs> like, nonstop. So, I guess before we jump into the finals, they will get started up on our screens here in a moment. Um, there's about 5,000 there's 5, of you watching, so big shout-out to... Nice. All of our followers, subscribers, and people watching from Twitch homepage. What you are watching right now is the Pro Chess League Summer Series. Um, I suppose that the first step to introducing that is to introduce what the Pro Chess League is. Uh, it's a global uh, chess league that has four divisions all across the world. Uh, you have a team roster, and you can have free agents. You can have local players. We have a ton of cities across the globe represented. And ultimately, that culminates in a Final Four esports-style showdown for the past two years in San Francisco. Uh, I, I think most of our fans know that, but if you don't, now you do. And this is the first edition of the Summer Series, where we combined a representative, like a grandmaster, uh, from each of these teams, uh, and enormous fan involvement. So there are clubs on chess.com where people join and then can ultimately represent teams in head-to-head -head matchups while these top players also play each other uh, representing their teams. And yeah. this ultimately leads to big prizes and potentially an opportunity to get back you know, into the league. So whew, yeah. that was a mouthful. Thousands, thousands of dollars and you can score points for your favorite team by playing for them or even just by joining their fan club because just by joining their fan club, the Raptors fans have given Daniel Forsen Another white, as we see here, C4 again. I guess we're going to see a lot of C4 if the Raptors fans keep uh, keep filling that club up. It looks like Dimitri is hoping for a Grunfeld or a King's Indian. Mm -hmm. Probably, maybe he'll... Okay, he's actually not going for D5, so he'll probably play D6. Uh, or C5, interesting. He's just going for something completely different. All right, Benoni style somehow, Benoni King's Indian. Yeah, Black usually play, will play like D6, E6. Uh, you can also go for G5 if you're feeling exquisite and fancy. Yeah. He's tempted. He's giving it a little think-a-roo. Yeah, he's thinking. Yeah. 
Why? Well, I, I mean, one thing that I love for anybody who's new to the pro chess league, I love that it has this like mix of the local flavor and the professional flavor. I think they got the balance just right by saying like you get one free agent per match. Otherwise, you can start incurring a small or a significant penalty in like your rating cap. So most matches, you'll see three local players and one free agent. That mm. means the team always feels like your team. Like if you're from Barcelona, like it feels like it's your team. But it also means like if you need to hire Vichy Anand or, you know, Anish Giri to make your team competitive, you can go out and do that. Yeah, and, and what I find interesting is that uh, it, it, it's just kind of like it's just r real sports. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a whole esports component, which I had no idea about uh, in the past few years that's been blossoming, where players who specialize, for example, in a certain certain area of a game will move and be traded from city to city, live with that team, train with that team. So it's very, it's very much like real sports. Uh, yeah. the, obviously chess is a little bit different. You can't just go from uh, India, Armenia, you know, to San Francisco, for example, I don't mean to get your hopes up, David, but potentially uh, for the next season and train, but uh, it, it, it chess, it just shows kind of how chess really has no boundaries. And this, ability for these teams to pick up free agents like new york had players from belarus uzbekistan who were actually new york locals but they're now, locals that's yes, that's the new york yes, thing like yes. you can be from anywhere and be a new york local that's a special new york thing so uh that, that 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 i suppose is true yes and we but we did have free agents though we did have free agents from poland from russia mm -hmm. um so it's it just shows kind of how, how amazing chess is. I, I always argue it's the most international game. Of course, soccer, football, whatever you call it, can probably be a close second, but I argue for chess. Yeah. So. Anyway, yeah. that's a feel, feels good moment for, for the fans. Yeah. So um, in this knockout, uh, at stake is money every week. Like you just win money in the knockout. <laughs> um, but also quite a few points in the team standings. So uh, the winner of this game between, uh, you know, Forsen and, and Dimitri, the winner is going to get three points for their team. Just by winning this one knockout is three points in the season. Um, there's, you know, 12 points available per week total. So, you know, your team needs somewhere around 10 to 12 points to qualify for the Summer Series Championships. So, I mean, if Forsen wins this, his team will score six points in the first week, a perfect six points, and they'll be like halfway, comfortably halfway towards making it into the Summer Series Championship. It's a great start to the season possible for them. Um, second place will get two points. So Kolars won't, won't be too upset you know, if he gets two points, but his team lost to uh, the Raptors in the live club match, so it would be six to two in the standings. I think he'd much rather win it and make it uh, you know, five to three. That'd be a lot closer. Yeah, I mean, Barcelona had, as you mentioned, and I don't know if the, any of you joining us just now are aware of this, but Barcelona had a very good start to the season. I remember doing some commentary uh, talking about how they're, they're the new kid on the block. They're rocking that central division. And then ultimately, it, uh, it just came down to Norway and to Baden-Baden, which I don't know if they were the preseason favorites, but they sort of were the dominant ones. And then Baden-Baden actually... I don't want to say if they shocked the world necessarily, but they made it to the, the, the finals, finals in, yeah. uh, in San Francisco to play against the, the Titans, yeah. uh, St. Louis Archbishops. Uh, but Barcelona is, I, I think they're here to stay. They have Spanish chess talent in particular is extremely, extremely strong. I think the sense of community in Spain is great. Uh, really, it's just, I mean, it's a countrywide phenomenon. You don't necessarily need to be in Barcelona. You can be in the neighboring town, but, I, I traveled in Spain and, and I actually did visit a, some some chess clubs and yeah pe people love it. I mean so many so many actually former Soviet players moved to Spain. I have a, a family friend who spent his career living and playing chess in, in, in the Soviet Union then in the United States and now he's been living in Spain for 20 years. So Ooh. a lot of, lot, of, lot of talent in Spain, whether it's you know Spanish or or international. What do you think of this King's Indian Benoni for a second like, it seems like Black's opening stuff up on the queen side. I mean, it's at the cost of a6 and c4 maybe being weak. What, what, what would you say? I think it's a, it's a very nice rapid weapon. I, I did notice that a lot of these 
grandmasters when I play against them don't have too much respect for a 2380 IM and uh, they actually do try to play like this sometimes okay. uh, with this giving me the two bishops but creating some yeah. queenside havoc blitz bullet especially uh, I don't play a huge amount of rapid uh, and you have to be very precise with white like you need to combine a patient approach with covering your your weaknesses with slowly kind of targeting your opponent's uh, weaknesses as well. I mean, a6, c4, and d6, David, are all up for grabs in a lot Okay. Of so, well, rook a2 seems like exactly what you're what you're prescribing. I mean, it looks like we're defending our weakness, we're being patient. Yeah, but what's next? Queen a1? <laughs> maybe. Queen a1, is that is that the idea? Maybe, uh, or... maybe queen a4, yeah, maybe... Queen Maybe queen c2 if we want to be really patient and bring the other rook to a1, and then our queen's also helping to cover b2 and c3. Like, black might have some tactics uh, with, for example, knight c5. Mm -hmm. And then white needs to kind of ask, okay, do I take c4? Right. Now it, both players are always asking themselves if knight c5 can be answered by bishop c4. Mm -hmm. Gotta wonder, every move. Yeah, can I play like this? I don't know. Wow. Something like knight e4, knight's trade, now b2 and c4 are attacked. Um, and if b3, black has knight c3. Speaking of wondering, uh, yeah. why don't we take a peek at a wonders game, David? Okay. <laughs> what is going on here? I don't know if this is full tilt or, or, or what, but I I'm not going to lie. I like white's position, uh, but... It doesn't mean that it's good. I like a lot of things, and they're not all good, like Oreos. But a wonder is conceded space again. Uh, looks like White's played like eight more moves than Black. <laughs> yeah, this is... I wonder if I wonder if Braggy was cheating somehow. Not so, to use the c word, but that's just a joke, everybody. I mean, but David White has made fifteen moves, and five of them have been with a piece. Ten of them have been with pawns. If Braggy teaches any any students, they're gonna look at this game and go, but coach, you did it. <laughs> but coach, and he's like, but I'm ahead in development at the end of it all. That's like yeah. the magic. That's the magic here. Ahead in development at the end. All right. So a wonder has to challenge that bishop, bad as that may be for his dark squares. Um, because he just, you know, didn't have the space otherwise. Knight b6 was played, both eyeing the c4 outpost and to allow that bishop to develop to d6 instead of e7. I I don't know if I agree with that chat sentiment. Like, a wonder loves cramped positions. I, <laughs> I, I, this might have just been a byproduct of the way White has played this. This very early G4 London Verisov hybrid. I've seen it played in, a, in an over-the-board game, actually. It was played right next to me. I think the players were Craig Hilby and Graham Free, if I'm not mistaken. Southwest Open 2018. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know why I remember stuff like this, but... It's just sort of how my brain works. And White won that game in 20 moves. Actually, I think Graham Free was White, and he was steamrolling Craig Hilby, who's a Bay Area guy, I think. Or no, he's a he's a San Diego guy. SoCal, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, a wonder played Bishop G7 when it was, like, clear that White could play H6 at will, and he would have to go back to F8. So that was interesting. Um, I think a lot of times, you when you've got a player who's very resourceful defensively, people then go ahead and say things like, oh, this guy likes bad positions. Like, because they think like, oh, it was so fun to like escape it and like win the game. But like, I really doubt there's anybody who's like sits down to a chess game. is like, I hope I get a bad position. I, I can't imagine that. Honestly, Levy, I think that's got to be an exaggeration. Well, I don't know. Do we, do we think that cramped and bad are synonymous? I mean, in the human uh, not body, necessarily. Yes, but in chess, maybe not. Cramped seems like, like a negative ish way of talking about a space disadvantage because we also have to remember a wonder did suffer from this kind of h6 thing last game but then he he broke out with a pawn break uh, yeah guys when, when when you're lacking space uh they do say that trading is is good but the thing is that it, it's a byproduct of of overextending with pawns i mean right now the move f6 is just gonna lead to great things i think for black it's it's french-esque Right, a pawn break with, with a move like F6. Now you can stay patient, do nothing like bishop d7, but then white is going to play c3, knight e3, knight e5, knight g4, not in that particular order, but uh, and then I'm going to take away the pawn breaks that you'll that you'll potentially be looking out for. So 
if a wonder doesn't play f6 right now i i don't understand chess personally right yeah i had the f6 arrow up this whole time so yeah i'm with you but i i think we're going to pop over to the other game for a second because you know knight c5 was played the pawn was sacked and i think we have to evaluate like who's who's coming out ahead here <coughs> So the idea was not knight c to e4, but rather queen to b4 here. And uh, that lines up two bishops on the fourth rank. I it was uh, looking at too much to notice that before. Yeah, it seems as though black has sort of figured some things out. I mean, it, it was at the cost of a pawn, though. Uh, almost feels Benko-esque, yeah, when black completely clears the queen side with bulldozers and is like, all right, your extra <laughs> pawn there on, on, on b2... But the problem is that well, he's down two pawns. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's down two pawns. Pawn. <laughs> he's down two pawns. The problem is he doesn't have his C5 pawn or his E7 pawn, so it's not clear, like, like what, what's the scenario where he wins something back and then even has a good position. Right, exactly. Uh, my friends, we should also mention, while, while we're having all this fun here, that, the, that after this is not the end of the show when this, when this is over. Uh, the way this works is we have one club match, between the two teams. Then we have the knockout, and then we have the head-to-head -head club matches between uh, the, the next two teams in the division, right? So yeah. Reykjavik and Pittsburgh uh, have to play against each other. Uh, yeah. And that means that you guys can get involved. You still have time. So if you go to yeah. Pro Chess League in the Summer Series page, you can join the club. Also, I see the mods there. Love the mods. Big shout out to the mods. Uh, join the team. And then in 34 minutes, we'll we'll have the we'll have the club match. You can represent one of the squads. You can't represent both. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. But. So um yeah so I mean they're they're playing for third fourth place in the knockout here Reykjavik and uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, a wonder did play f6. So not 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 going to leave you with any existential questions there. Uh, that was the way to play. But uh, you know you guys can pick whether you want to play with Bragi or with uh, a wonder as your first board in this live club match that's coming up. Um, so, oh, sorry, a move did get played. Rook a8 was played. I think the idea was if the bishop retreats somewhere passive, he just trades a rook on a2, takes on b2, and tries to blockade the dark squares and, and hold for a draw. I think I think black's only really playing for a draw there. But uh, queen e2, rook fb8. Forsen has kept his two extra pawns so far. Hey, being up two pawns is good, but uh, them not being to go and being able to go anywhere is not. It's you know? not. So if you have two, you own two jets. I don't know about you, David. I, I don't happen to own any jets, but if you have two jets laying around in the garage and uh, they, they have no fuel, yeah, uh, kind of just rotting, you know, rotting assets. I think right. So, uh, yeah. will you ever push the B pawn? No, it kind of holds your entire position together. Will yeah. you push the E pawn? Okay, sure, but then you surrender dark sword control. Plus, your E pawn will most likely just be a liability in the future. I don't know what to do here for, for... You're right. It's hard to see how to get the B or E pawn going. And I guess my answer to you would be that chess is a patient game. You know, you can take your time. You can maybe play queen C4 at some point, trade a piece or two, and try and generate some scenario where at some point you leave the B2 pawn and you play like rook A6 or something, and you go after the D6 pawn. And mm -hmm. because you've got two extra pawns, you can all offer all kinds of different trades. You can play knight E4. You can offer all kinds of different trades where like yeah maybe you like drop one of your pawns you get one of their pawns and suddenly what you're left with is much more usable yes if you can make some sort of uh, transformation to the position uh it, it's going to be really really nice the thing is it's so hard to figure out how to do that <laughs> in classical you can tank for 20 minutes and map out you know whole whole road map and decision making process based on how your opponent is uh is going to play but the other thing really that that's that's i think a an important thing to touch upon is, is the fact that there's opposite colored bishops. I think if the bishops were of the same color or if there was a bit more symmetry in the minor pieces, white would actually have a very tangible advantage. But yeah. Because black has a standalone dark squared bishop that just can't really be targeted. I mean, you could play like knight e4, but then you would hang your knight yep. uh, or queen f3 or some move, but the bishop will always hide out. And that in and of itself offsets white's <laughs> material advantage. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you yeah. plug this into a computer, it's fascinating because white is up two pawns, but it'll show something like plus 0.5, which is so weird. It means that black's position is so good that it offsets a one and a half pawn advantage, right? So mm -hmm. that's a big compliment. That's a big compliment to what black's got going on. 
Yeah. Okay. So you're pretty impressed with the two pawn positional sacrifice. My perspective is, is, is different. So we're going to see what comes out, but my like expectations that somehow white can use this. Um, I don't know how I can't tell you how <laughs> if it were a blitz game, no way I'd find it rapid game. Probably not. Um, well, let's, if uh, I had two hours on the clock, I'd like to think I could find something for white here. Now I, I do think that black doesn't have any winning chances. That I will argue. Um, that, that seems fair. <laughs> that, that, that I will argue, but I will say that losing this position would also be impressive. Like would also be impressive. Okay. Yeah. So that, that is, that, that's, that's my point. And I'm sticking to it. By the way, cool. 7,600 of you are watching the show right now. Shout Jeez. out to you guys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. Hopefully that's a lot. No one's you realize, like, you realize if you guys all join the team matches, we could have a 3000 board live club match, right? Yes. Please. Uh, don't do that though. I mean, like we want you to join, but that might actually crash it on our end. Uh, ah, it's not going to crash the chess. <laughs> all right. All 7,700 of you join the club match. Yeah. We've had tens and tens of thousands of players playing live on chess.com at the same time. It's no problem. Humble brag. I like it. We got the club match starting in 30 minutes, my friends. Uh, We've got a yeah. lot of club level players, so it doesn't matter if you're like, I'm not good enough. I'm like, look at these strong players. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Look at the, the bottom board matchup right now. We've got a 1,067 player lonely who needs to represent Pittsburgh, guys. Go rep Pittsburgh. They need a little bit of a push. There's six or seven players right now on the Reykjavik side that don't even have a matchup. You can get yeah. involved on ProChessLeague.com. If you've got nothing to do, just, just join, have some fun, play some chess. Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Oh, we've got a possible repetition here from Force and Rook A1. Dimitri shouldn't think too long about it. Just go back to Knight B3. As you said, there's like absolutely no scenario where Black wins this down two pawns, no matter how nice his position is. So just make the repetition quickly. And now we're having some think. So what's he thinking about? <laughs> rook A4, Knight A1, Rook B4, Rook B4 seems very I risky for White. Shouldn't go Rook A4. Rook A4, I mean, I'm just going to go back to B6 probably. Okay. I mean, you could also take the two rooks, right? I think it's only white who's endangering himself. Rook A4, Knight A1. Yeah. Look at you. So I don't need the bishops. Yeah, might be right. And again, that, that bishop on F6. Very, very strong. How does one join again? Okay, we, we, we have said it, but repetition. Yeah. Repetition for emphasis, as I was taught in public speaking in my freshman year of college. Uh, there's a couple ways to get involved. There's commands in the chat to join the, uh, the chess.com clubs. Of course, you need to, these are club matches, right? Head to head club matches. So you've got to be part of the chess.com club. And then in 30 yeah. minutes, the club match begins. You will be paired against an individual on the other side who is your rating. It's not an arena format, not a Swiss. Two games of 10 plus two against someone your strength, approximately. And you can rep the teams. That's all. That's yeah. all there is to it. It's really easy. I mean, right, right now, one other thing we could add, Levy, is you have to be joined to only one of the two clubs. If you join, if you click on the link to join the Pawn Grabbers fan club and the Reykjavik fan club, then you won't be able to join the match. You have to pick one or the other before you go into live chess. Yes. Uh, join one club. If yes. you're in both clubs, you have to leave one of them, play. You can always be a fan of, their, of them after the match is over, rejoin their team. Um, if you want the highest chance of being paired and playing right now, it looks like you would join the Pittsburgh pawn grabbers team. If you like, if you don't care about these people, you're like a wonder, I don't care. Broggy, who are you? And you just want to play chess and you don't care what, what you're involved in. Then the best way to get into that match would be to join the pawn grabbers team. Cause they've got a few less players right now. You're more likely to get paired over on the pawn grabbers side. And uh, you'll get paired like, you know, by your chess.com rapid rating against people somewhat, in line with your rating exactly so you're not going to be paired against these top guys these are just representatives of the of the top teams and yeah i mean it's if anybody has any questions anybody's curious what this is all about we do we try to explain it as much as we possibly can but come hang out with us in chat if you're interested in more chess.com events here on twitch hit that follow button Make sure that notification bell is on. We have we have events all the time. There's a I believe there's another event coming up even later today where we're going to be playing against subscribers. If I'm not mistaken, it's Krikor Mechitarion, strong grandmaster, who will actually be playing in the Pan American Championships. So Sorry that's... to interrupt you, but look at the chess man. Something insane happened here. Oh yeah, Forsen Forsen went to like trade a piece, sack the B pawn, but it looks like maybe he had a tactic afterwards here. 
oh, whoa, Rugby 1, is it over? I mean, the idea is like on Queen E2, Rook B8 is check, and then White plays Knight takes E2, even saving the Knight from the Bishop, and, you know, you Rook up endgame instead of a Pawn up endgame. So, Rook to B1, I mean, the, I don't see how the Queen gets out of losing the Rook on B8 other than by sacking the Queen here. Wait, that's 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 crazy. Uh, yeah, you have to play Bishop C3. Yeah, okay. Bishop, Bishop C3, you just got to push me as well. Then Rook B2, maybe Rook B2. And the hope for black is still opposite colored bishops. The white's bishop is bad, and that black can somehow mm -hmm. you know, blockade the whole position. But it's going to be tough to do, right? Yeah, okay, this is gone this for it. Completely, completely crazy. I mean, interesting. So, so Forsen, I mean, he'd been avoiding this thing hanging the B pawn for so long. Maybe Dimitri just assumed that white couldn't do it, right? Like all that hesitation repeating one time, is that all just some deep psychological ploy to set up for this rook b1 tactic? I don't know. I mean, maybe <laughs> it's uh, it's who knows. Uh, he he, he might have just 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 gone on a on a bit of a an excursion here. Bam, but look how bad that bishop on a2 is. I mean, bishop e1, and I don't even see how white moves his pieces here. Yeah, in, in situations of material imbalance, uh, you, you need your pieces to really kind of shine. Uh, and and right yeah. now, Black's pieces are the ones shining. I've, I've, I've been talking about this dark squared bishop for the past 15 minutes, but this is such a valuable asset because it has no counterpart. It runs around the board freely, right? Targeting up to E3, all these things. And uh, it's just it's, it's such an important piece in Black's position. And now it's going to wreak havoc against F2 and E3. The light squared bishop would also be running unopposed if it could even walk. But yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, look at this sad guy. I mean, if he goes to b3, he just gets captured. If he goes to b1, he just gets captured. So for him to ever move, the queen needs to move while keeping her eye on him. But the knight's covering a6 and a4. So honestly, I don't see how white ever moves again. I mean, I'm, at this point, I'm starting, I'm starting to get concerned. Maybe he'll get mated somehow. Would you take the pawn or would you go to G3 here? It must be asked. Yeah, it like... must be asked. Bishop... Why did he go to H1 instead of H2? I feel like after Bishop G3, he'll lose. He didn't go to F1 because Bishop E3 always came with, I guess, Rook F2 stuff or Rook G2 and Knight D3, something like that. I... No, I'm thinking H1, H1 to not allow this... Yeah, 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 no, 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 absolutely. I'm just, I'm just saying. Like, remember, Kal uh, there was this king f one moment between Kalars and yeah, you're uh, right. But yeah, why would you not go to h two? Maybe he didn't like bishop e three g five bishop f four something. I don't know. I would love, I would love an explanation. Yeah. Well, let's see. What has he chosen? He played h five, so he didn't yet decide between the e pawn or bishop g three. I suppose. Ah, uh, but see, now there's no back rank mate because he got rid of the G-pawn. Still, it feels like Kalars is playing for a win now. Yeah. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't like this at all. Yeah. Complete paralysis for white. White cannot move the queen because he will lose the bishop, and he cannot move the bishop because he will lose the bishop. So the game will be decided by the queen side pawns. Amazing. Uh, excuse me, the king side pawns. The king side. Is his idea that on bishop takes e3, he has maybe queen c3 to untangle himself? Is that is that part of what's going on here? I I would love to get Daniel back on the call right now. Mm -hmm. Daniel, what have you done, my guy? What have you done? Crazy. It looked like a deep trap, and now we don't see how to really move for him. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what to do. I mean, probably it's worth at some point moving the king, sacking a pawn, and then just getting out a little bit. But, uh, okay, let's say black just plays like king. Oh, you cannot play king g7 because of bishop c3. Okay, bishop g5. Yeah, like just king g1. What, what do you do? King g1, king h1, king g1, king h1. Probably nothing, right? I mean, you can't. You can't move. And if you weaken your king too much, at some point I will probably be able to move my queen. Mm -hmm. Give up the bishop, go to like f6, for example, start attacking you. We've been really ignoring the A Wonder game. 
Yeah, if he could trade the bishop for the d6 pawn, that would be great, but he probably Whoa. can't even do that at the moment. All right, I'll switch over to it. Show me what's going on here. What has what? happened? What? A wonder was down two. I wonder was just busted. He was just dead lost. Let's see. Two connected pass pawns, and then White chose to go with Queen C five, huh? At some point here. Oops. What? Why? Why would he play Queen C five here? I have no idea. I have no idea. Fill me in on the logic. Alternatively, Queen D four would keep the pawns as pass pawns, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, David, this is almost as the level of knight of five. Except now it's just the, it's just the queen endgame transition. Jeez, queen he, c5. Well, I think there went his win, right? He must have overlooked g5. Uh, he must have thought that after f5, he's just crashing through. But I'm, I'm even curious if g5 is, is required. I mean, you can play king f7. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, whatever he thought he may have had, like he had more before he gave up his connected pass pawns. Um, so it just just doesn't make sense, really. We've just had a draw offer somewhere, I think. I heard it ding. It must be in the Kolar's game. Although both games are actually headed for... It could for be either game, right? Pawn grabbers offered to draw. All right, a wonder has offered to draw here. <laughs> to trade his G pawn for one of the white pawns. Yeah, this is just a very simple draw. And there it is. Big. We will have our first bullet playoff. So that's going to be a bullet game. The other game, they also kind of still seem stuck. There's more to think about, but uh, I think we just had one repetition, right? Rook H, Rook H2 check, King G1, Rook B2. That was the first repetition, and Forsen is not ready to call it a day. Plays pawn to F4. Interesting. I, I don't know if F4 is some somehow trying to play. Uh, can you play like King G2 now? King G2, King F3. Just go for it. Am I am I am I crazy? I'm just a little seems, impaired. Maybe seems possible. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, now the bishop will be hit, right? The king will be active. Oh, he's gone for it. If you yeah. don't take three, I just go king f three for free. So wow, sure, that was like getting bars there, not bad. I think probably probably take it and switch the bishop to d two to yes. attack that pawn structure from behind. Idea of rook to b four and uh, trying to take apart all those pawns. So I mean, black's not even really down that much material, right? So it doesn't, he only needs to win one or two pawns before he's the one playing for a win. The bishop needs to, no, I, I mean, I, 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 I like what he's done here. This, this is the best practical way to play. Daniel's played great today. He so you done. think he's got chances to win this for white? I'm well, not I sure. Don't, I, don't I think mean, for is. black? Yeah, for white? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. Uh, okay. But you've got to play for something. Although now that I'm thinking about this, Rook B4 is a very big problem. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I spoke too soon. I noticed this Bishop D2 Rook, B, Rook B4 problem. And now F4. And my, my plan had potentially been to blow things up on the king side. But uh, right. uh, that's. But I feel like right now, if we look at F5, pawn takes F5, G6, pawn takes G6. Like, we sort of blew things up a little bit, except our bishop and queen and king aren't really threatening black yet. So. No, nope, nope, nope. nope. And, and, and amazingly, white has played the past, like, 10 moves without any pieces. Yeah. So... Yeah, so the question is, will the bishop or queen ever move again? And you cannot do something like bishop b1 here. I was thinking, wait, did he just... He just hung his bishop. Yeah, I mean, on purpose, but yes. <laughs> no, are, are, are we sure? <laughs> I'm sure. What? I think he was quite aware of, of the issue with the... Uh, with with the 
uh okay but i think now we'll see rook a3 i don't get it david <laughs> okay david help me <laughs> i don't know what you want me to say i mean I, the bishop was not coming out of there all right a long time ago i said that black can't win this game right it would take real effort on white's part to lose and and I think we just hit that moment. I yeah, think we can't. White... We cannot. We cannot say anything against the effort that Daniel has put in here, refusing to draw this game. Um, he has really tried very, very hard to win. Let's look one. at just rook a four. There's no perpetual because queen d eight, king h seven. You're not going to make a draw here. Yeah, I think he may even be planning bishop takes f four here on queen d six. I mean, assuming that White is going to try and take the d six pawn. Yeah, I okay. He's got 15 seconds and 19 seconds now. We have to figure things out. This is I think Bishop F4. Yeah, Bishop F4. The end game is of course losing. You don't have enough pawns. Honestly, even if you did, uh the knight is still extremely powerful at locating. Yeah, Bishop F4 is just a fancy move. Queen C6. This is lost. I have officially decreed it. This is lost. But how? Um, move Bishop, the rook on the yeah. fourth rank, probably yeah. to see. You cannot push the pawn. Now the king will get out of the way. Uh, Bishop right. g five. Can you go? Is that now, is that too much? Yeah. Now he can take the g pawn because he defended the knight with the rook. If he wants it, he can also go knight to d three, perhaps. Knight d three was fancy. It is fancy, yeah. But it's also consistent with, you know, how you try to play this position. I think. Okay, so give a check or play bishop f6, king g7. And yeah, bishop f6, king g7. Oh, but then you need to be careful about... Ah, uh, this is also very smart. Knight e6. That's just putting the knight on a good square where it handles the d-pawn and everything. And uh, Dimitri Kolars has this one. I think I think you can call it here. d8 is covered twice. Soon it'll be covered three times. There it is. Knight f8 now, and it's resignation. Oh, knight f8, queen e5, bishop f6, queen d4. So he plays this yeah. first. He plays this yes. first. And now, now it's over. Okay, he's not even interested. He's going to start his own instigating actions. Yeah, but he's got this in a mul multitude of ways. So, what a game! I mean, Kalar is re <laughs> he really yeah. understood that position? He and also credit to Esteban. I mean, Esteban really tried hard to win, and it just backfired. And that's just yeah. sometimes that happens. Yeah, he tried everything from that position where you said that. Uh, that white wouldn't be able to do much with two knight pawns. Four, knight d4. Knight d4 is pretty good. He doesn't see it, or he just doesn't want to do it. Because Going for bishop h4 next, I think. <laughs> yeah, or g3. Won't, won't be too bad either. Or g3, similar. Rook d1 is mate. Yeah. I guess he really didn't even need knight d4. It doesn't... I mean, this is not even, like, worse. Like, a computer might have done this. <laughs> yeah. Just g... Okay, it's, it's just over, yeah. Uh, where's the where's the nail rook d2 to threaten knight h3 is the simplest i bet mm -hmm. queen a1 move the king or block with the pawn and knight h3 is mate maybe you'll play queen a3 but then rook d1 what a game and we're still waiting on a, on a, on a bullet tiebreak right we got a waiting on the bullet tiebreaker it hasn't popped up for me so i don't think i've missed it nope double check with the queen and checkmate, leaving Kalaris. two queens on the board for the opponent, forked by this bishop. Majestic. Yeah, Kalaris wins a, wins a tough, tough game with black. Very impressive. Yeah. Uh, we just have to wait for the That's bullet. huge. That's huge. The snowballs needed that. I mean, Kalaris got beat one and a half to one half in his match earlier against Daniel. And uh, Daniel had this advantage of the white pieces. And uh, I don't know, it was a, an impressive game from Kolar's as far as positional sacrificing, right? I mean, sacrificing first two pawns purely positionally, then that queen sack to sort of trap the bishop on a2. Quite nice. Very impressive game. The Reykjavik Puffins account, that's uh, Thornton's and he goes for another time on. The last time he did this, it did not work out well. No, uh, it did he, not. Uh, can you take b5 here, by the way? Perhaps. Uh, I might get all my pieces out. Does it does it win anything special here, Bishop B five? No, but okay. Also, just giving it a good look. Yeah, he he definitely is. Uh, now I think you can. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Now you can. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, this is this is unbelievable. You play two time autos and you're losing before move 15 on both. Come on. Do you have knight d6, queen g7 here? Is that is that part of the idea? Rook d6. What? what? That's oh, wonder that. waited like 10 minutes for that game to finish just to completely rain. Oh my god, bishop e5, queen g7. Send him home. Bring a different representative next time. What is this? Oof. What is this? Sorry. I and and you know, I I, I will say, as we've crossed 9,000 viewers, uh yeah. I I'm 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 very sorry. I'm very sorry. Okay, please, please, please don't come up to me at a tournament in the future and say you said very rude things about me. You played rude chess. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? Yeah. I yeah, but if you ever game. make a mistake like this at a tournament, they're going to say the same things to you now, right? They'll be like, Levy, go home. You're not playing round five through seven. Look, That's it. Look, I don't play the same opening two games in a row and losing a combined 30 moves in two okay. games. I'm just saying. But if you ever do, then they can send you home. You're okay with yes. that. Yes. I, you know, I played a game like this in Chicago Open. Forgot the theory, 15 moves in. I lost. Yeah. Now I know that opening like the back of my hand. So you're not going to do it twice in a row. No! <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> no. Who plays the Taimana for draw odds? Have you ever heard of a player playing the Taimana of Sicilian for draw odds? Come on. <sighs> Having said that, David, I also yeah. won Blunder of the Week. I mean, that it's seems to be his that seems to be his opening. Maybe, you know, he just went with what he had. Bishop E5 is dirty. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Good God. <sighs> yeah, this is I, um, uh... I approve of a wonder's time management. I think it's not what you normally see in a bullet game, but basically he thought for 10 seconds on Bishop F4 setting up his sack and then another 10 seconds going for the sack. He invested 20 seconds and had a deep long think for a bullet game standards. Then he finished the rest of the game using only two seconds. He's got all the time left from after that. He was just, he was just there. So that well that actually wraps up the knockout portion of our you know of our of our show so a wonder yeah. brings back the pawn grabbers to a third place finish uh dimitri kolars pulls ahead for his baden baden snowballs uh at, at the end they're winning winning the knockout segment uh yeah. so barcelona comes in comes in second place despite actually winning the club match earlier it gives clubs an opportunity to to kind of put themselves up ahead uh, after maybe faltering in the beginning uh, so ultimately, our current standings, Barcelona Raptors with five points, Baden Baden with three, Pittsburgh with one, Reykjavik looking to get on the board. But they do have a very strong showing right now in the live club, in the live match format. My friends, that starts in eight minutes. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, talk to a wonder uh, before the live, uh, before the club match starts, if we have time. So we'll be right back. Don't cool. go anywhere. We're heating up now with 9,000 viewers.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope the knockout has inspired you and you're ready to uh, get your own chess on because it is time for a fan club match. Yes, we have a pretty fun itinerary, I gotta say. We start off with Barcelona going up against Baden-Baden. Uh, and of course, a player interview right before that. Fans get to meet some of the grandmasters that represent these teams in the summer series. And we have the knockout where all four of these representatives of the top teams go at it. And then we go back to another uh, fan club match. So yeah. we've, uh, we've, we've been on this rodeo before. It's actually my first time doing this show. So I'm, I'm, kind of, uh, I'm kind of excited to see what happens between these two teams. We saw a very, very convincing showing from Barcelona friends. And uh, we, yeah. we need Pittsburgh fans, actually, to kind of get it rolling. They had the lowest growth of the four the past week. And they also have a bit of a weak showing today. So go join that Pittsburgh club. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're a Puffins fan, just, you know, laugh, stomp on them. Or I don't know if Puffins stomp, but, you know, stomp on them, laugh that you had more players and, uh, you know, taunt them and maybe they'll show up next week. Yeah. Uh, Reykjavik is a team that actually did not represent uh, the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a joke repetition and just hope that some of the players, some of the fans that weren't watching earlier are watching now or vice versa. Uh, when I went to Reykjavik, there was no puffins you know and uh, the puffins were not in the pro chess league this past season yeah. but they're a fun team and i think they i think iceland is iceland has the most grandmasters per capita in the world so it would be kind of nice to have them in the pro chess league you know i feel like yeah. they're a, they're a very fun team fun mascot fun club so let's go let's go represent them yeah, you guys have three minutes to get into the match. We'll be talking with a wonder who we just saw get third place in the in the knockout section, and we'll be playing first board for the pawn garbers. We'll we'll get to talk with a wonder after this live club match is over. So, as Levy said, really cool to get to know and a little bit better some of the some of the GMs here. Really feel like you're on a team with them if you're playing on their team and you get to talk to them afterwards. And a friendly reminder about the format is, you know, we've got three minutes before we start. You're going to be playing two 10-2 games just against the person on the other club that's approximately your rating. So this is not an arena-style format. You don't have to commit hours and hours to this. Uh, it's mm -hmm. also not a Swiss. You just get two games. Two games yep. against that one person and... Uh, what prizes are at stake, David, in these live? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the big one for the people watching is probably the fan prize, which we haven't yet mentioned today. We've talked about how much money is at stake for the teams. Um, and, you know, if you want your team to be successful, obviously you want your team to win big prizes. But the fans can also win prizes. Each division, which is a three-week segment of the summer series, each division has a best fan prize, $250. Uh, you, that's that's cash. That's not like store credit. That's not like discounts on on you know chess.com t-shirts or chess.com memberships that's 250 in cash and uh if you want to win that basically levy and i need to know who you are you gotta yeah. you gotta tweet at us send us your games blog your games stream your games it's basically just a matter of how much we have to hear about you yeah exactly there is no there, there is no kind of set criteria or bullet points you have to hit uh we kind of leave that up to you if you want to write blog posts about the games that you played if you want to get involved on Twitter, there's plenty of hashtags, right? You can tweet at ProChessLeagueChess.com. Tweet at us if you have to. Uh, just don't, you know, don't tweet excessively at us. Uh, I, you know, or if if you're you're up for winning some money, yeah, I suppose. I suppose, get I suppose a little aggressive. Yeah, get aggressive. Fine. A little okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can handle people getting in your face. You're used to that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a New York thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, so I mean, participating is great. Playing your games is great. I see Art Vega here up for another match with the Puffins. I have seen Art Vega playing in match after match in Division A as well. And now here he is in Division B playing both matches. So yeah, I mean, log a bunch of games. That's a good start. But, you know, one board below him, Bigfoot, um, his opponent in the previous match, now they're on the same team, but Bigfoot is streaming his, uh, his game. So that's, that's a good move too. you know, stream your games or blog your games talk about them afterwards get active in your fan club you know like help help the other people on your team to get better for next week share your experiences all that this is probably the first edition of some sort of uh, chess format where the fans input is not just at a very at a very elementary level like you can directly have an impact on the matches on your team's success uh, of course it does ultimately come down to your top board representatives and how they do but giving them the advantageous match situation 
that's on you guys. That that really comes down to nobody else. It comes down to how how much you want to get involved. And you don't have to be a local. You can be you can be wherever you are in the world. Uh, all right, we're underway. Rake it. There we go. It's for pawn grabbers. Time to start. Do the time to start. Know that it's that they're supposed to be playing, or <laughs> presumably. Presumably, once you get this far, if you're a GM, you sort of like know the rules. You know, Braggy knows what he's up to. Um, I mean, he did just play a bullet game. He's had a few minutes to collect himself. Um, I guess if we wait for him, we could check out some of these other top games. Yeah, let's do it. Because uh, Pittsburgh is bringing two more titled players to their team here. National Master, every fish knows. That is every a... fish knows. To dodge puffins, right? If you're a fish, puffins are bad news. Every fish knows. Let's watch this game. Yep. And then we've got Fide Master Nax UEB playing a good old mainline Grunfeld here. That's... Still no Bragi. All right. What does the fish know? The fish knows this old symmetrical English position that's pretty fun. Isn't the move here Kingy 2? Wow. Yeah. That's, that's wild. He knows that the move is Kingy 2. That's Knight this F4, is the... King this... F1, and then Knight to E6, I think, to fight for the D4 square. Yeah, this is the line where white gets a huge uh, a huge development advantage, including with the king. So doesn't doesn't look like white has any idea about how to play chess, but actually this is just modern theory. There is Yeah. yeah I've seen Korchnoi play this line long ago. Well, I wasn't around to see it, but I mean, you know, I, I watched the VOD. I yeah. played through his games later. Yes. I watched um, Kirchner's VOD, you know. He was saying poggers and the, these other things. At the end. <laughs> like poggers, you don't even deserve to play with me. Yes. Um, anyone think... worried about Bragi after a minute? He did show up, played in exchange, Caro. Um, you know, wonder very, very well versed in the Caro Con. So if you're wondering about, like, you know, what openings the pros are choosing to play in these matches, um, a wonder is uh, taking this pretty seriously. This is his A-list opening here. Yeah, I wonder as a 2600 aspiring 2700 ELO player has got probably two or three openings in, in each branch. Yeah. But the Karakhan is becoming very trusted by these guys. I've se I'm seeing it played in, in, in every tournament between 26 and 2700s, and that's you know that's nice for me. Yeah, that's a big one for a wonder. It's a big one for him. He's uh, He's logged a lot of games here. Every fish knows is having a deep think about this bishop to c4 move. I wonder if, like, because I think black normally just plays 96 first. So he's thinking, like, when you see an unusual move, you often want to think, is there some way to punish this? Is there something wrong with it? You want to somehow move your deep on without letting black play knight back to e6. I think he should have played d3, right? So you don't want to play bishop e6, knight e6, really. So the moves to consider are d3 and bishop b5, which both looked pretty good. Might have also had a move like, you know, exquisite move, like queen b3, for example. But I, I mean, I, I have no idea. Right? I, mm -hmm. just well, what's wrong with bishop b5? Like, blacks have to block with, say, their knight. And then I think, oh, with the bishop. That clears e6. That's what you didn't like? Ah. I don't know though, because now I feel like d4 is coming, right? Because mm -hmm. d4 it hits is. knight on f4. Um, I'm not thrilled here if I'm playing from playing uh, playing black. Reykjavik draws first blood, by the way. They've won. They've won Ooh. a game. First point. Puffins. Puffins. The puffins. Puff in their chest. It's one zero. Yeah, and do remember that Pittsburgh actually scored the win in the head-to-head -head knockout. So. Yeah. Pittsburgh's a point ahead right now. I mean, obviously, a club match is worth three points, so the Puffins can can get ahead of that. You don't want to have those zero-point weeks. That's what's going to keep you from qualifying. Yeah, the, the summer series is designed where a team that does actually, like, for example, scores zero points. That's a horrible week. You lose everything. Yeah. Uh, you can actually, next week, sweep and bounce back. And the yeah. fan vote counts, ultimately, so, you know, to, to, to throw in the third-place team in a group. So, yeah, fans, you, you guys... Don't dude, get competitive with this stuff. But don't, don't. sweeping, I mean, six points is tough. Six points in a week is tough. And even then, if you get six points and you had zero the week before, you're only averaging three points, which is which is average. I think I think you really want to avoid the zero point weeks. That's my that's my deep analysis. Is uh, 
I've, don't get slapped. I've I've spent my life being average, so there's uh there there's room to grow. I feel it it's it, it's not it's it's not over. <laughs> <laughs> so All right, I'm trying to keep myself had... motivated, David. <laughs> We had the d4. Now, what's he going to play? Knight takes d4. Bishop takes f4. Actually, this this looks like it backfired. Queen I, queen. I, I much preferred playing d4 and getting a knight to b5 and keeping the queen on d8. I think that was that was smarter. Okay. Not to say I'm I'm, I'm a better player than this guy. Right. Uh, probably am, but that's I, I don't think I, I don't think I'm allowed to say that. So this is much different because the queen is actually deceptively perhaps but much more active on d7 than it is on d8 on d8 it controls one diagonal to the to its right to a5 and then straight down to d8 on d7 right. it controls three different trajectories so yeah every fish knows has invested a lot of time and energy trying to refute this opening i mean you can see with six minutes against against almost nine but uh, it doesn't seem like they've quite found found the way what knight e5? Okay, fine. Queen d4 is probably completely fine. Yeah. Yeah, but. this can't go too badly, but uh, I think Black can answer with knight e6 and sort of avoid the worst of this opening. Right. So let's you don't. Get, even, yeah. Um, but. let's get back to the puffins. Uh, I mean, you know, to the uh to the first boards. Um, how do you feel about this position where White's just played f3 to try and uh, get rid of a wonder's knight on e4? I think this dispels this fiction that a wonder likes cramped positions because he pushed just about every single pawn forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very biased. I play a lot of these kinds of positions in classical and in blitz. So anytime I can start to mobilize, play like F4, you know, knight F5. Uh, I do know that it doesn't come without without problems. You you you're, you you do have a bit of a Swiss cheese position, and mm -hmm. a a strong player will find a way to punish. This kind of play, but I wonder once f4, and it's it's not so easy to prevent. That is important to you know to say. Like there we go. Th this kind of stops this approach for a moment. Uh, yeah. This h4 move because if f4, you can take take target f4. Uh, but I mean, just bishop f6, keeping he's, the structure intact, and yeah, he's trying to fight against it. But it is it is tough because White is fairly cramped here. I mean, his knights neither of them is giving me a good impression at the moment. Um, g3, I can, knight g3 also seems kind of clumsy because queen f7 just totally shuts down this knight h5 idea. The I think he, I think he even overlooked that. That's such a nice mm -hmm. move, queen f7. What's the difference between queen f7 and queen h7? Well, queen h7, if he plays f4, there's going to be a queen trade. Right. And I think a wonder wants to uh, win the game with a kingside attack. If I had to guess, like. I mean, obviously, there's many, many scenarios, but I think that's like his prime condition right now is to roll the king side, you know, lift a rook to e7, play f4, then queen h5. Something feels off about knight d2. I felt like white would even need to play a move like queen a6 or just do something a little bit more aggressive because now he's going to have to retreat both knights with f4. Queen a6 at least was threatening to take something, attack something, uh, and black would have to react. But look, I mean, just f4, e5 is coming. Knight yeah. d2 didn't seem right. I don't know. I think I think a wonder would would just mate white. I think it was getting grim. Like the knight on b3 had no other moves. There was no way. There was no room for the knight and the bishop. White's got like this kind of like problem that I used to get often in the Benoni, where you've got every piece needs the d2 square. And you don't you don't have a right. second square for your second, third, or fourth piece. No, um, this is very impressive. Just just a very nice job from a wonder. I mean, if he he's using his experience in the Karakan. Uh, again, I don't, I don't know Thornton's uh, repertoire against Caro. I don't even know if he allows it. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, just real quick, Reykjavik is blowing out Pittsburgh. It is seven to zero. Well, is... a wonder better score pretty soon to give some hope to his uh, to his side. Yeah, and they're going to need that. That is uh, that is an astounding scoreline. Yeah, wow. I mean. The Puffins definitely had the bigger crowd waiting for this match to start. Um, I guess they've got a fantastic fan base. I mean, that, I mean that's just so dominating to see something like that at the beginning. Right. Um, so the Puffins, I mean, incredible start. I mean, in general, the team with more players has won 
I think a big percentage of club matches, you know, because you've got more players. It often means that, that down the road, you've got a little rating advantage on the bottom boards. Um, so, I mean, the pawn grabbers answered with two extra titled players joining at the end for their side, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. Now it's nine points for the Puffins. Yeah, the... Well, I will say this. It might not look good for this week, uh, but Pittsburgh Pittsburgh was victorious, right, in the knockout, and they might be victorious up top, so I wonder we'll get them more points. But guys, Pittsburgh was such a powerful social media presence. I know. Man. They had such a good fan base throughout the entire season. Their fans got to step up. I mean, there's we can't let anyone off the hook here. It's not the players' fault. <laughs> it's the fans. Fans, you guys, you guys got to get involved as well. You see a bad week like this, what do you do as a chess player? You come back stronger. You learn from your mistakes. Don't have another blowout. Don't have another uh, whitewash, right? So I was gonna say, like, stay at home weeping. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. Come back stronger. Okay. As Axel Smith wrote in his book, he once lost a very hard game in an open tournament, so he closed his blinds and said that he didn't deserve sunlight. So he lived without sunlight for a week. Don't do that, okay? Wow. That's yeah. that's intense. Yeah. That's so, intense. So Yeah, but I mean I mean usually I'm not harsh but but I'm in agreement with you. I mean they got a million fans, where are they? Exactly. Are Listen, they? if you're upset, don't be upset at the at, at the matchups or the results. You got to go, "All right. We flopped this week on our on our top board. Our top board has to show up. He's contractually obligated. Where was the rest of the team?" Yeah. Speaking of how about this? This is probably way too fancy and unnecessary. Okay. Can Black play knight e4 and then... No, never mind, never mind. I was thinking knight e4, queen g6, try to play f3. I, it's just... I'm, I'm looking for creative finishes, but yeah. we, don't, we don't need that. I was looking at it too, but but I don't understand why his last move was bishop g7. I was expecting like bishop h4 followed by resignation. Yeah, so, I... I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. maybe rook takes e5, knight f3 or something was what he wasn't sure of. Huh! That's very nice. Yeah, Bishop. Is that possible? Two. What? Rookie five. Knight, knight f3. Knight f3. Okay, wow, he's actually going for this. Huh. Amazing. And I guess after queen, what what is the idea? So after queen g6, is it just kind of paralysis for white? It's really difficult to make some sort of move. Um, oh, well, he's okay. He did some, he's just going to take back, right? Yeah, he did. Okay. So, Rook so queen e4, knight f3 is perhaps a blunder. Although, I mean, it could just be a sack, a positional sack. We saw Dimitri do something like that. Um, and rook e4, maybe then queen g6, or maybe then f3. Yes. Could be either. Oh, f3 could be good enough, right? Yeah, rook e4, f3, right? This is, yeah. And then if we trade everything on f3, in the final position, the white king is just all alone. Yeah, queen g3, rook e2, bishop coming. It's all it's all very, very bad. If you play rook e5 right now, probably I throw in the in-between move f2. I'm not even sure I have to do it. Okay, okay, white played bishop e3. This is an idea, yes. Man, this is like pure violence from a, <laughs> from a wonder here. Yeah, he's unhappy with maybe the way he's played earlier. Knight f3 is 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 coming in a second. So what is what is wrong with ah? But queen g2, knight f3 is queen also queen g2 okay. is going to cover it, right? And you're always losing in exchange somehow. Always, it's always going to backfire with knight f3 now coming. Yeah, rough. So rough. wait, how does this ever work out for a wonder now? For After a wonder? Queen yeah. Well, queen g2, knight f3. Then queen takes f3. Uh, I take your queen. Okay. And then knight f3, rook e4. Oh, somehow I've got everything in the wrong order. Yeah, because you, you... All you're... right, thanks, Levy. <laughs> <laughs> me out. I was, yeah, I was also thinking queen f3, but I'm just like, no, you can never... This is the best he can do. And then he has to okay. hope that he can solidify somehow, you know, with the e3 bishop hitting b6, but... Uh, it's no, the rooks are too powerful, I think. But if he trades everything, then his miners are both hanging at the end, right? So, like, so then king f2 would he has hold. to play something like king f2 to hand cover them, huh? And then I take g4, and you cannot take b6 because I'll double up and hit f3. So, oof, yeah, a wonder just Big needs ball. to figure out if knight f3 is important or if he has anything better. 
man, this is so complicated. I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with what they were doing here. I have to admit, I could not actually, keep up with it. David, he actually doesn't even play Knight F3. He plays Queen D5. I feel yeah. like Queen D5 is, is like playing with fire. I think that move might like not work somehow. Okay, well, let's imagine Rook F4 maybe, the most straightforward move to, to get the Rook off of. But Rook D4. Worth with, dangling. But Rook D4, Rook F4 makes a lot more sense. Wait, what about... Yeah, Rook F4 was it? Also thinking King H1. <laughs> just no, no, no check. I just don't let you check me. I see. I, I think Queen D5 was... Okay, what did he do? He played Rook F4. Things got traded, 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 Knight into D3. David, yeah. I think we both overlooked that after Knight F3, you can just take back on F3 with the Knight. And Rook E4, there is Knight G5. I think that's why I wonder didn't go for it. Oh, man. Knight F3, Knight F3, Rook E4, Knight G5. The same thing that was saving him in that other line with Bishop H4, Rook takes E5, and then Knight F3. I you actually, lose the material, and then you come out with the fork. I think that White might have gotten out. I mean, it's he, he's, he's not out of the woods. The same way that a wonder, unbelievable. Yeah. A wonder wasn't out of the woods against uh, Forsen earlier. Right. right. And actually getting his rook to the second rank and defending his b6 pawn, he still seems, I mean, it still seems like anyone's game, honestly. Hey, if I'm white, I'm going knight g4, knight f6. <laughs> I'm asking, what are you doing? Or knight h6, creating an outside pass pawn, potentially. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. Should I play bishop e5 here for, for, uh, for a wonder? Bishop e5. To avoid that. Uh, I guess that, yeah, that's... That does force a trade, right? I I have no choice. I gotta take. He he doesn't. He doesn't. Okay. Just didn't feel that need. Um, I think that would have drawn. This should be five. You trade, knight check, king has to go to g3, and then rook c2 at the end. Should be should be a okay. But instead, it's gonna stay a little bit more complicated. He's going after that g5 pawn. Maybe maybe he's encouraged by the four minutes against one and a half to play something more complicated. Maybe he thinks right. uh, maybe he thinks Bragi is gonna gonna blink or make a mistake. So far, not many mistakes from the Puffins. They're up nineteen and a half to five and a half. So they're just they're running away with this match. You were asking, does that happen? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of runaways. Right. If your yeah, team shows up like that, well, it looks like it's paying off for a wonder. This risk he took. I mean, he's got a complicated position where his time advantage might start to come into play. Yeah, this well, the fact that White only has a minute here to kind of figure out the rest of the game is starting to yeah worrisome, right? Yes, I don't I don't like it at all. Knight e three looks pretty dangerous against either Knight f four, Bishop d two, or Bishop d two right away, but I could see. See White losing the knight here. Um, he can't just run off of the third rank with his king because he'll drop his bishop. So he could play bishop e3, then there's probably knight g5 check. Bishop takes g5, bishop d2. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's actually sound. That, that wins for black. Okay, so he went with bishop e3. This doesn't feel okay. I mean, ooh, that's fancy, but it, does it work? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just saying. This and then bishop d2. Okay. And he'll um, either get back the bishop on g5 or the rook on c1. King e2, yeah, I mean, you need to take on g5 now. Mm -hmm. But, okay, like, let's say I play... Yeah, that, that, that move makes a lot of sense. Rook c6. I was thinking rook c7, but... Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, rook c6. I'm first of all, I'm threatening rook g6. First and foremost. Okay. I'm going to win your king f7. Okay, king f7, to, he was trying to avoid knight e5. So now knight f2, that's that's nuanced. Rook e3, maybe? Uh, rook e3, or rook b2, or that. I mean, there's so many possibilities at this point. Yeah. Should still be a draw. On king d7, there's knight e5, but there's definitely pressure on white. He's got 15 seconds. Um, just because the position might be a draw if he were a computer. It's not, not much of a sure thing. Yeah, I like bishop f6. 
He wanted to come to d4, and uh, Bragi did not let him. He's got to hide his bishop away somewhere else if he wants to bring his king across. <laughs> that's, a, that's a way to hide your bishop. Yeah. There was a song about that, right? Like, hey, you got to hide your bishop away. Is, is that an actual song? Yeah. I didn't know that. Now I do. Was it like a Huga song? You know, like the O Capa Blanca? Was that like a one of those or? No, it was the Beatles. I, I, nope. <laughs> Did not know that. Uh, there we it's go. It's not the Beatles. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm just making it up, man. Listen, you can pull one over on me and then hit me with the, ha, ah, you're just too young to know those Beatles songs. Too young to know the Beatles. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't think, no, no. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't one of their songs, no. So Rook H6, it's, it just looks like a draw. Just looks like a draw. I think with 15 seconds, White's going to lose somehow. All right. That's a bold prediction. That's my call. Something's Something's got to go wrong for him with 15 seconds and a bunch of pieces on the board. Wow, Wonder's, so an, Wonder's an ambitious guy. Goes down. The the, the uh, pawn grabbers on the top boards have really scored a lot of points. Their top boards have held it down. Uh, Art Vega losing... Bigfoot lost two games already? Wow, that is impressive from Bigfoot. Yeah. I mean, to lose two games be before some first games are even over. Yeah. I mean, my man. <laughs> Either he wasn't using his time or he was making it so easy his opponent didn't have to think, thinking one or the other. Rook c3? Rook b4? Rook a3? Something? Man, I'd really want to try and grab that a pawn. Can I? Uh, instead, he gets checking distance. Yeah, that also makes a lot of sense. Uh, get away. You got to get your knight away. That's that's the second song. That one was by ACDC. Yeah, hey, you got to get that knight away. Can you get the ape on now? Can I have it now? Can I have it now, please? Yeah, I think he I think he might have just gotten it. Mmm, ape on. King b7. Yummy. Well, nobody's going to say that there's any drawing chances once it's two connected pass pawns. I'll say it. I'll argue for it. I'm good. Let's go. There's chances to draw this game. Bishop should go to d8. But then rook d6? Didn't see that, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> rook d6 and bishop c7, then I just go back. If King All right. C oh, Maybe then I, I play rook b6. Play. Maybe I need to play the rook back to a1 to c1 or something then. <laughs> yeah, this isn't... I'm not I'm not like convinced that this is this is so trivial. But yeah, rook a1 is very logical. Rook a1 king d2. I'm I'm annoying, man. I'm I'm not letting it happen. You're like if nothing else, I will annoy you before you win. Listen, when you're low on the clock also, you 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 start somehow getting a little bit more creative. Uh creative. You know what I mean? Like Yeah. It's uh you you just kind of know. All right, well, this is my lifeline. I mean, I gotta I gotta stop simple threats. I had a hundred and fifteen yeah. queen end move queen end game a couple of weeks ago, like last week, and just somehow when you get that low on the clock, oh rook c four. That's for rook c four. Yeah, Ooh. I didn't want to interrupt you with every move I I thought of. I liked your story, but you saw rook c four. I did see it. Yeah, Get this idea. Nice. Look at you, b five rook c four. How creative. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hello. The wrong pre-move. My God, what? That's the five seconds coming into account. What What five seconds? What kind of pre-move is Rook H5? <laughs> he was losing it anyway, man. Was the he guy was never pre-moved in his life? Did he like not know how to cancel a pre-move? I don't know. I don't Dude. know. Come on. He was losing anyway, and he had five seconds. <sighs> Hikaru would have drawn that. Not to not to you know compare. Oh, and now we have another car. Oh, uh, wonders beaten him before he would have beaten him again. So one of my favorite variations in this particular move order mm -hmm. is knight e four, queen e four, bishop e six. Knight e four, queen e four, bishop e six. Okay, c four, or yeah, c four, knight e seven, and then you play knight f six, and then you get the bishop to f five, and then you still get your bishop out. Nice. Yes. This is also okay, knight d7, but but I like bishop e6. Lenderman beat Eric Hansen with it in like 25 moves. 
uh, in the in the St. Louis tournament. I guess every time the Cara wins in 20 moves, you remember that game, right? Because it's not like the most common thing. 20, 30, 40, 110. It doesn't really matter. Yes. You're like, there were these 17 times that people won 103 move queen end games. Yes. Uh, we All should right. also note that before we take uh, take a quick break, that knight e5 yeah. does not hang a queen, everybody, because bishop f7. This is actually a very tricky move order, and you force black to play e6 and keep a passive bishop. Uh, so things are heating up now in the second game. But uh, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. And we'll see if, uh, if Reykjavik's representative can make a comeback here in the head-to-head. -head. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers star, a wonder, Liang, also America's youngest star, um, playing here with White against Grandmaster Braggy Thorfinnson of the Puffins on first board of this live club match. Yeah, we left off everybody with uh, Knight E5, just a terrible, terrible move by a wonder. Just kidding. No queen blunder. Bishop F7 on the board. His, yeah. Hanging his queen on move eight. But uh, as you said, he forced e6 out of uh, Bragi. That keeps that bishop locked into c8 for a while. And Bragi's reaction was to play c5 and say, hey, it's going to be hard for you to even get this sort of d4 pawn center that you want. And uh, this yeah, is and actually already almost lost for black object. Really? Yeah. The position that's on the board. Wow. Uh, so this bishop f4 move is going to hurt, huh? Yeah. Because I mean, you need to move the queen again. And. Black white is completely developed and even has a rook on d4 ready to go to to h4 or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I think objectively it's 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 very very bad. Like I'm considering just rook a d1, but even moves like bishop g3 to to start playing you know attacking chess on the king side. I mean, black can't move. What does black do? Black can't move any pieces. So it's move 15 and Levy's already looking at h7. That's pretty scary. <laughs> if you rip up in here. Uh, yeah. Rook AD1 before Bishop G3. I think everyone's going to admit that's a sensible move. Sometimes in a rapid game, you know, you just play the sensible move without thinking too long. And uh, a wonder still has nine and a half out of ten minutes, so I guess uh, he's pretty comfortable with his opening here. Yeah, I, I've I've had some success in blitz games when opponents don't know this move order. Like if they try to play Knight D7 and then Knight F6, uh, you can hit them with Knight E5. This is really the big drawback is that after E6, White is always better a little bit uh, since your bishop takes a long time to get out. Do you see that move? What on earth is that horror? A5? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's... Yeah. It's is that good. the new way of resigning? I mean, if you really want to want to flex on your opponent, you can just play A4. <laughs> and there is basically nothing that Black can do. I mean, Black can't move. How about G4? <laughs> David, you can, David, you can push literally... You could play B4 and probably still have it there. You let me move any anything I want, and and 
Proof. Yes, the position is so bad that maybe even B4 losing a full pawn for nothing and opening Black's queen side might not. And, op and developing the rook and making yes. A5 look like genius. It was like yes. the only move to take advantage of B4 properly. Yeah, I mean, like what? Like he, the guy has time to move the rook. He moved to D4, back to D3, into the king side, and there is nothing you can do because you can't move the C8 bishop. I mean, you could play A4, but I would, I would really think it was just like a new meme for resignation, where like you move your A pawn a couple times first. I mean, I, <laughs> he does it again. <laughs> David, David, they gotta send me in for the Reykjavik next time. No, man, I'm serious. This is just how he's resigning. He's like, my position is so bad, I'm going to make a joke about it by moving my A pawn a couple times before I resign. He's just kidding. He's just kidding. I I mean, but hey, maybe it's a deep idea. He wants to play rook A5. So he looked at this position. He was like, the only piece I could develop would be a rook on A5. So we're going to come back to this, and you're going to be right that white could have played A4, and that would have been like this genius move to shut down black's play. I... I don't understand bishop b3 unless he's got... Like, why would you help the queen move someplace? Oh, okay, just to bolster your center like this and then play something like rook g3. He was tired of having one piece that wasn't aiming at the black king. Yeah, now he's like, got this both... Do. I don't know, I'm not so sure about this, though. Like, It blocks both rooks? <laughs> well, the, yeah, the rooks are going to h3, g3. <laughs> They don't care about the D file anymore. But like, what about, I mean, I'm thinking like knight D5, knight D5, bishop F6, even F6 to just start kicking you out slowly. Knight like D5, cause... that's the piece that's stopping checkmate on H7. No, 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 it's no? a, no, my idea, no. I'm threatening knight F4, I'm gonna win an exchange. Wow. Right, so. That's bold, yeah. So rook to G3 would probably be played, and then what were you gonna put on F6? The pawn? the pawn? Yeah, maybe the pawn. Maybe the pawn. Why not? Dude, I'll, I'll do it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's see. They've, they've done something. Knight to e8. Well, that's not what you called for. Knight did to he, e8. That is not I, what you wanted. Did this man really just play knight e8, David? He did. David, can I, can I end the show? <laughs> I'm so disgusted. <laughs> you're, looking for the, you're looking for the out button. David, what is 98? I mean, I know a wonder did it, but he's a wonder. I'm, I, I, I'm telling you. I, I, Wait, I whoa, mean, whoa, 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 Knight takes G6. Hello. I'm telling you, Black's moves <laughs> almost look like a joke to me. This game, like, that's my David, only explanation. David, Knight G6, F G6, Bishop E6, Bishop E6, Queen E6, Rook F7, Queen G6. I'm calling it right now. Queen G6, puzzle rush. It's game that over. Is that is just foul levy. I can't even move the pieces as fast as you're seeing that. That is, that is, that is disgusting, David. <laughs> All right, let's find a slightly better defense for Black. <laughs> what, After what Queen six, we'll play Knight to G seven, Queen H seven, King F eight. That didn't help much. Never mind. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh wait, what about Rook G seven? To be serious for a second. When, when, when Rook G seven? Yeah. You didn't see it. If Bishop, oh. well, it's not that clear, is it? Not, not a hundred percent. Rook G seven. Uh, probably you just go back and give another check. Queen back to E six. Rook F seven. Rook F seven. Rook H seven. Rook H seven. Slightly annoying. Um. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Whatever. Whatever. It's fine. If All right, knight to... g4 was played, and on h5, he didn't play rook h5 either, which is probably what... This also works. Yeah, this did, but... Okay, oh, he took on f7. He did something. Don't worry, Levy. It's getting nasty. Yeah. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. This is, this is very nice from a wonder. Uh, someone in chat said, stop dissing a GM. It's my, it's, it's my job. Yeah. You yeah. know? Go He's tell literally, sportscasters. Literally well. paid to diss GMs. Yeah, David, you too though. You no, know, we're you. You just you're polite about it. You're like, I'm not so sure that's the best move. I'm out here like that is an abomination. I usually try and like hold back a little bit. Yeah, I. That's yeah. I think on yesterday's Arena King show, somebody asked me a question about the World Championship, and you know, what do I think are Ali Reza's chances? And and I kind of said the answer that gets echoed. I think by a lot of people, it's 
you can't start predicting world championship trajectory based on a 2680 teenager. You need to see how well he goes through the 2700s. And then some guy was like, well, why does this IM get to talk about, you know, the world championship? And I was like, I'm not saying I'm playing for it. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, let me say one other thing on that point, Levy. This like these people are complaining about you as an IM dissing like a GM who's rated like, you know, 100 points higher than you. Yeah. You know, um, they're they're probably like 1200s who sit at home, like clicking on like their stockfish, making fun of Magnus Carlson, you know? Okay, like, so yeah. how how could Caruana not have played Knight F5? I would have done it in a heartbeat. I would have like mated Carlson. Oh, I actually have a very funny story about this. I was recently oh, the Queen Sack. Oh no, no one's not a sack. position. Oh. All right. Let, let, let's go, let's go peep some other games. That that was extremely convincing on the Wonders half. Um that was that was very, very well done. We can yeah. look at the board three matchup, not Sway versus Optimus. Some strong players here, low on time. Yeah. Uh, I do know. So the, the funny story that I do have about this as Reykjavik really, really, really doing a great job today, uh, holding down some, some fairly seated matchups. Uh, so in, in Vegas, they had the, the blitz tournament in the Las Vegas chess festival, and they did not remove the diagrams of the open section that had just finished. So there was five or six games up on these big boards and the, the spectators could see them. I think four draws and two wins, right? Um, so one kid, like, you know, 13, 14 years old, uh, walked up and was like, me, chess is so stupid. Like four of these games were draws. Chess is just a draw. Why am I even trying to become a stronger player? And I was like, <laughs> dude, those were like 70 move games. Like, <laughs> like there was no draws in the opening. The guys fought it out. Also, two of those games were decisive. Like, what is this? What is this complaint? The, these players who clearly don't have the level of understanding that you know that these top guys have yeah making these claims but then you you know you see players like hikaru who are just like yeah chess is a draw i mean it's just a draw you just got to get over it you know yeah so yeah well hikaru's hikaru's certainly allowed to say that so yeah anyway he's put in the work to have an opinion and you know yeah if someone doesn't want us to have an opinion and you know is like who are these ims to tell us the evaluation who are these ims to like anything then you know David, let's just become GMs. They can just stick. They can just stick with Stockfish. They don't who need are, to watch. Who right? are these non twenty six hundred Elo GMs? And then we're going to become twenty six hundred. Who are these non super GMs to tell us what to think? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I'm uh. Newsflash, newsflash. Mm -hmm. Anish Fury and uh, Sam Shankland weren't uh, weren't going to do this show for you guys. So <laughs> they were they were busy, you know, playing in super tournaments. So I I'd, I'd be pumped to see that show. I'd be pretty. <laughs> We got to get Geary in the commentary booth. I mean, the guy, the guy's hilarious. He so. would be good. I think he would be like as good as he is at, at chess, you know, meaning like, you know, top, top five. Some people don't like his Twitter banter. What do you think about it? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. I think he's got, I think he's got the top Twitter game out there. I mean, I know, I know, you, you know, I know you know more about Twitter, Twitter game than me, but I would give him top spot. Some of his stuff is maybe a tiny bit cheesy, but I mean the guy the guy's hilarious. Like he he's yeah. making chess players seem approachable. Uh people think that, oh, you know, he talks a lot, whatever, he doesn't back it up. Okay. He's still, you know, you could be a top five, top ten player in the world. And okay, you're not competing for the world championship, but we, yeah. we're a bit uh we're a bit antiquated with our expectations of chess players, you know. Like, I mean, if you're number four or five in the world and people are saying like like he's not delivering. Like, does that mean like only Magnus Carlson's ever allowed to say anything? Everyone else is just like, ah, oh, you know, they didn't. They really aren't. They aren't. You know, living up to what they're saying. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, I don't. Even even some GMs actually have have the same mindset. Like they're, you know, they're like, well, you know, Gary, loud mouth on Twitter, whatever. <laughs> I don't. Uh, anyway, I don't. I don't think so. I I think it's great. I think being a fun ambassador for the sport, you know, whether that's colorful personality or, you know, some, oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think we're lucky to have him. I mean, to have somebody like top five, who's willing to like, just like hang out and like make jokes with everybody else. It's pretty good. But um, in the position in front of us, we've got a feeding master who's really, um, who's really struggling a bit to try and make things messy against Optimus after drawing their first game. And then uh, losing a pawn in the second game here, 
Um, he's really having a tough go of it, I think. Ooh, I like that. G5. G5. Yeah, G5 is, is aggressive. I really, really like it. I approve. I mean, you're fighting over this F4, E5 tension. And uh, yeah, at some point, you just want to like crack white, right? You don't want to sit there forever. You want to just smash. Maybe even F4 here. Yeah, maybe, maybe four here as well. Four there. So now that's going to be rookie seven, I think, in a rook trade. Is there any problem here for Optimus? I mean, I really like what Black's got going on. F4, G4, H5 coming. That's all looking good. Don't know. Uh, don't know. But is it mathematically clinched so far? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. It's it's been clinched since the time of our break. Okay. Well then, I don't know if we have any updated standings. But obviously, Reykjavik striking back, uh, not able to win the head-to-head yeah. -head knockout. But they uh, they they do get some points for the overall. They're three points for this, which is uh, as you said, average for the week, and and maybe a good enough goal. Hey, if they can keep fielding like these these massive guys uh, in the in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth slot, like hey, they might not have the head-to-head -head success in some of these knockouts, but they have done a, a great job today with their fans. So I think I think we should say that Pittsburgh has actually like stabilized after that initial bleeding, right? Because they were down like 10-0 and now they're down like 11, 12 points. So basically basically they were able to hold even after a bit um that's not that's not too bad as we see these pawns rolling down the board I mean, jade is made. does look pretty bad don't hang that I mean, jade is mate so 92 c1 would be would be a bad approach to this position he's really but trying now but you take it. yeah now you take it queen a8 is just there's nothing there there's nothing there he doesn't even need to take that bishop push again just push yeah I think the push is coming. That's going to be checkmate, not just a new queen, but a checkmate. What? I'm not, I don't like that one. No, absolutely not. Eh. Now, yeah, because now, now some pieces. Oh, well, this is also bad, though. He should have traded it in a different way. Uh, but chaos is about to ensue. The players yeah, are chaos in ensues now. I mean, he's got an extra knight, but he's just moving it in circles, and we're in bullet now. Should play. Uh, don't, don't take A2, though. He's Should gonna probably play b5. Queen b6. I mean, white is white is big bishop d4. Bishop d4 was was winning a piece, I think, of queen c6, maybe. Yeah, Dude, it would have been tough. Is, is white about to save this and maybe win? I mean, black doesn't seem to know that the game ends by a checkmate. He's trying to win by you know capturing things and moving around in circles. But the only way to win this is to checkmate. I mean, you just have to checkmate with the queen and knight. That's the only way. He's gone for knight e4. Bishop d4 was winning a, a full queen. Or at least a, a piece. Oh my gosh. Knight f1 is coming. Queen f2. Uh, king g1, bishop d4. So go, he has to go king h1. But I don't bishop. know if he'll find it. Yeah. I didn't think so. <laughs> he Sometimes just... you get that feeling. You know what somebody does or doesn't see. Knight g3 is repetition, by the way. So king h2, knight f1 is just a draw. <laughs> wow. Drawn. Oh man, the ner the nerves, the nerves, yeah. and, and with that actually the match is is over. Wow, well, as the match concludes, kind of a sad way to see it go. I mean, like to not play e3, e2, e1, or you know checkmate at any point is kind of sad. I always prefer to end on a checkmate. How do you like to end the match? Yeah, I, I would have liked to to end it, but in the similar fashion. But Reykjavik does win the head-to-head -head match, uh, despite their their top seed being being uh, outclassed by Wonder Liang. And speaking of Wonder Liang. I believe that uh, we're going to take a quick break to get all, all set up for, uh, for another player interview. So don't go anywhere. We have a wonder to talk to before we end the show.
Welcome back, everybody, for our final segment. Uh, now you get to meet Grandmaster Wonder Liang, uh, the star of the Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers and their uh, live club match loss, though he himself won two games here. Wonder, thanks for uh, talking with us. Uh, thank you. So uh, this, uh, this last game that you played, we were wondering when your opponent was playing a5, a4, neither Levy nor I had a straight face. We were like, what is Black doing? A wonder is going to put his rooks on g3 and h3, both of them. And were you able to keep a straight face? Did you think your opponent was was serious with this a5 idea? Um, well, I actually had a very similar game against Jeffrey in, like, I think the US Championship, where I also had, like, this dominating piece on e5. I think it was a knight. And, like, he just threw down a5, a4. And it's, it's kind of awkward because, like, it gained some space on the queen side. But the way he did it, like, my bishop was on b3, so he actually got... So Jeffrey Xiong played a5, a4. It was probably slightly different. No, I mean, it was a little like different. But, a little I mean, different. It's, it's a... I would say it's, it's an idea because, I mean, like, the rook can come in. I mean, it just didn't really work because it was a bit slow in that position. So what's shocking me here is like you're giving me this impression like there's almost nothing someone could do on like a chessboard that you haven't seen somewhere before. I mean like even this thing, you've seen something that's like in your head it's analogous. You've got like reference points for this. Um. Well, I've played a lot of games, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh. wow. I mean, at some point, like I think both he and I recognize that his position's kind of difficult to play, and when that happens, you just kind of you know. Sometimes you kind of have to mix it up, so I don't know. So I thought, wonder, it, was, I thought it was reasonable. I asked, I asked uh, we had Daniel Forson on earlier. I asked him the same question. Uh, well, I guess this one will have a slight twist. So I've actually, I, I don't know if it's fortune or I've had the misfortune of playing you in the past three or four years. And, you know, obviously every single time you're going, you know, up and up and uh, obviously hopefully uh, you will continue to, to improve on the rating charts. Um, you're obviously always working hard, making fine tunings to your openings and, and everything of that nature. So how difficult is it to play so many games like of online rapid chess, which some might argue mean not that much, and not give away some of your opening ideas that you intend to save like against Wesley in the US Championship, for example? Um, I think the answer to that is normally you need to have some opening ideas in the first place to be able to actually show them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I just kind of handle it how I normally would. I would say that this past season, I have gotten some pretty horrendous openings compared to, I think, 2018. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's many games where I simply just didn't really get out of the opening. So um, maybe accidentally playing really bad moves, that's that's a good way to go about it. But, uh, but yeah, opening questions in Rapid is always really hard because I think having a good opening just kind of determines the rest of the game. Um, yeah. I, also I would know. say, I mean, generally, I just try and keep it, I mean, keep it standard, keep it solid. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm not really that worried about giving away <laughs> opening secrets or anything yeah. like that. Got it. Cool. Cool. Um, what, how, how do you feel about the turnout this week from your team? Because obviously, like, you played quite well today. Right. But, um, you know, a lot of points go to this like um, fan club match and there just weren't as many Pittsburgh Pawn Grabbers fans as uh, Puffins fans. Where were they? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't really been focusing too much on that front, so I probably should have tried to encourage them more. Okay. But, um, is that is that Grant's job to turn out the fans? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not putting blame on anybody here, so. <laughs> I think that that's just how it goes sometimes. Um, I mean, I, I feel like one side probably would have had an advantage in terms of the user turnout. And uh, as it turned out, that was the Puffins. So, you know, good job to them for getting the word out. But, uh, All right. Sometimes, you know, it just doesn't really turn our way. I think we've had, uh, I think we've had an interview with you like two times in the past two weeks because we also saw you play against uh, Gladura. So I apologize. If you know, you've, you've heard this question before, but uh, just talk to the fans about uh, your, you know, your, your upcoming plans in the future for classical chess, like over the board chess. And uh, maybe if, if I could intertwine a, a question of 
how much Twitch do you actually do? Do you watch yourself? Like, do you watch a Hikaru stream every now and then? It's it's been a rumor in the grapevine that Wesley So likes to watch when Hikaru streams. So I don't know if uh, if if you feel the same way or how many of these shows um, do you watch? I don't know. I tried watching sometimes, but it, it's a kind of confusing format to me. So um, I, I did watch Hikaru stream once, but like it seemed like he was interacting with the viewers a little bit too much. So. And I really like to watch his analysis. So um, that was a little weird for me. <laughs> Normally, like when I watch other chess broadcasts, um, there's a lot of analysis going on and I think not enough um, viewer interaction. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching Hikaru's stream, but um, yeah, I, I really haven't watched too much Twitch overall. So and, um, yeah, I can't really answer that. Let's talk about the, the Pawn Grabbers organization a little bit more uh, one question i have for you is has the team changed with the change in general manager from uh isaac to grant um i just play the games so <laughs> i don't really i don't really keep up with this stuff honestly but um okay yeah grant has been pretty cool so um isaac has been wonderful as well so it's, it's neither of them cool made a difference to your ability to you know come to the board and play your matches um i mean I think they've both done wonderful jobs. So as far yes. as for me, I haven't really experienced any hiccups anywhere. So I assume that means that they're doing their job really well. Cool. Well, then maybe I have one more question. I don't know about you, Levy, but I want to hear about the, the odds of the pawn grabbers being back in the Pro Chess League next season since they uh, were relegated this season. You guys are probably going to go through the qualifications. Um, are you going to participate in that? And how do you rank the team's chances of making it through? Um, yeah, I mean, if I, if I can participate, I think I definitely will. Um, you know, as for our chances, um, I, I can't put like a definite number on that, but, you know, I'll try my best. And, um, you know, I, I think it'd be really cool if we could be back for the next season. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my last question was just going to be, uh, how, what are your goals and plans uh, for the rest of the year? How are you going to wrap up your 2019? Oh, um, I think I'll play U.S. Junior and then maybe a tournament in August. Um, I'm not totally certain on that. I think the U.S. Masters maybe. And as for the rest of the year, um, I'm kind of undecided on that, but you know, we'll see how it goes. So yeah, pretty excited for my upcoming events. Great. Well, David, uh, we'll be we'll be signing off here with uh, with a wonder, and I think we will just uh, say goodbye and wrap up with uh, with the standings and everything that's 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 happened today. So, thank you, a wonder, for joining us for for allowing us. Thank to you for here. having me. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Good luck in the future for the pond grabbers. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, all right. Why don't All we right. jump into the standings here? So We've that got, brings uh, up the standings. Yeah. <sighs> Barcelona had a good day, yeah? Scoring five of yeah. six possible points. They're up top in Group B. Of course, it's just the first matchup. We've got uh, got two more dates as the other teams go head-to-head. Baden-Baden -head. Yeah. also scoring scoring well in the knockout. Dimitri Kolaris with a, with a big, big win with Black despite being down two pawns. Really maintained the pressure. Reykjavik at three. Pittsburgh tough with one point, but... Uh, I don't know. I feel like Pittsburgh has the the fan favorite representative for today. I think a wonder is I think a wonder. Yeah, I think I think people loved loved seeing from him, and uh, he's really really funny. I mean, he did an interview for the for the Junior Speed Chess Championship match. Also, it just it just cracked me up. A written interview. I was like reading it and just laughing <laughs> by myself. So, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, the team already has a lot of fans, but a wonder is really going to help them keep growing that. Well, next week uh, we'll be we'll be back. Yeah, at the, at the yeah. At same, same time, same time, same place. Uh, I think even I think potentially the same people, and and if not, well, it doesn't matter because the chess is going to be the same exact format, my friends. Well, yeah. that uh, that just about wraps it up for today. Um, right. I think I think we we were doing a squad stream with Bigfoot, who represented Bon Bon and right. and uh, and Reykjavik. So I think we'll be sending you guys over to Bigfoot. Yeah, if you want to go hear about his excuses for uh, giving up a couple <laughs> points to the pawn grabbers, you can go check that out. Yeah, go give Bigfoot a hard time. Ask him how he lost two games before people even finished one. Yeah, Please go ahead and do that. 
So enjoy. Also, today is uh, coming up later. I think it's sub Saturday. That's that's also fun. If you're a subscriber of the channel, get some games in against Creekor. We'll see you later. It's been real. It's been fun. Take care, everybody.